Good evening and welcome to the January 18th, 2023 meeting of the City of Tuscaloosa Planning and Zoning Commission. This meeting allows for alternative participation in order to accommodate all citizens. Any written comments sent to staff were forwarded to this commission directly. At this time, I'd like to introduce our staff, uh, Jimbo Woodson, Deputy City Attorney, Michael Gardner, Civil Engineer, Zach Pons, newly named Director of Planning. Congratulations, Zach. Caitlin Giles, Development Review Coordinator, Haley Webb, Planner, and Tiana Rivas, Office Administrator. There are nine members of the Planning and Zoning Commission, all of whom were appointed by the mayor for staggered terms, with the exception of the City Council representative, who is appointed by the City Council. I ask that the Commission members introduce themselves and state their occupation, starting with Ms. Prince. Oops. Dina Prince, and I'm an attorney. Vince Dooley, UA Construction Administration. Tim Harrison, General Contractor. Eddie Pugh, retired. Uh, Bill Wright, business owner. There are sign-up sheets outside for public comment. If you did not sign up, you will still be given an opportunity to speak. Procedures. This commission will take up items in the order of our final agenda. The commission will initially receive a presentation from staff as to the details uh, of the agenda item. Additionally, we may hear certain matters involving the same property, such as an annexation and a zoning matter concurrently, although we will take separate votes on each matter involving the same property. After the staff presentation, we'll then call upon the petitioner to present their case. At the conclusion of the petitioner's remarks, we'll then call upon any other party in order to sign up, otherwise who desires to support the petition. And there we'll after a call in order of those signed up who oppose the petition. When it's your turn for comment, staff will introduce you to the commission to provide your remarks. Any written comments have been included into the record. We reserve the right to limit the time of remarks as to those agenda items with lengthy sign-up sheets or where continued from previous meetings. After receiving the remarks of those who oppose the petition, the petitioner will have the opportunity to respond to those objections. If the petitioner presents any new information in response to the objections, we will allow those who oppose the opportunity to respond to the new information only. During the course of this presentation, you may be interrupted by any member of the commission for clarification or additional information. Such interruptions will not reduce your allowed time. Once the commission members are satisfied they've received all relevant information, we'll then close for further discussion by the public, at which time the commission members will discuss the matter and then vote. After the vote, you are free to leave. These proceedings are video recorded and broadcast live. All in-person public comments should be made at the podium into the microphone. Comments made by phone or virtually are video recorded through the conferencing application. Please first state your name and address for the record. Jurisdiction. In all matters pertaining to subdivision regulations, approval of subdivisions within the city limits and its planning jurisdiction and as to amended plan unit developments and located outside the city limits, this commission serves as the final authority. As to matters pertaining to historic buffer zone construction, our decision is subject to appeal to the city council. As to all remaining agenda matters, including original zonings, rezonings, plan unit developments within the city and street vacations, this commission serves as a recommending body to the city council. In that regard, our decisions are in the form of a recommendation to the, be presented to the City Council, and the City Council will make the final decision on those matters. Subdivision approvals require the affirmative vote of six members of the Planning Commission. All matters which are recommendations to the City Council require a majority vote for an affirmative recommendation. This time, I'll ask any members of the Commission to have any conflicts as to any matters before us tonight. If so, please state for the record. Okay. I would ask that staff confirm on the record that proper notice has been given to all parties and interests as required by law as to all matters before the Commission tonight. It has. Thank you. Any comments from the Commission? If not, we will begin with any items that are being requested for continuance. Or I think Ms. Kreitz will be here speaking on short-term rental. Good 
Good evening, Commission. I know it has been a long time since you, you and I have gotten to spend some time at an actual Planning Commission meeting talking about short-term rentals. Um, so just to get you caught up to speed, a little bit before um, Christmas time, the council asked us to take a look at the short-term rental ordinance again and see um, what they deemed were necessary changes. And so in a back and forth, starting probably sometime in October, uh, we got to a place from the Administration and Policy Committee where they provided some input back to us and asked us to draft it into a zoning text amendment. Our uh, current zoning ordinance on short-term rentals was last adopted in May of 2019. So we've been trucking along with our current ordinance for quite some time. It is cumbersome in some places, um, and it also could be a little bit more clear for the Zoning Board of Adjustment to utilize when they're looking at those special exceptions. So what uh, we took to the Administration and Policy Committee yesterday, and they have voted to send to you today um, for a recommendation vote, are a few minor, relatively minor text amendments. I know I've been able to zip around to y'all via email. Um, but in summary, what it does is it adds criteria for our Zoning Board of Adjustment to consider. Uh, so they have primary and discretionary warrants that they look at when someone is asking for a special exception on short-term rental. Uh, we want to add in that the noise ordinance provisions would be adhered to, and then allow the Zoning Board of Adjustment two more discretionary criteria. One, uh, whether or not the short-term rental is a primary or accessory use of the dwelling. A lot of the discussion centered on whether something was owner-occupied or not. Well, New Orleans has been challenged, and a federal court upheld the challenge and said owner-occupied only is a violation of uh, interstate commerce clause. But the Zoning Board of Adjustment is able to say whether or not something is a primary use or an accessory use. And then we're also adding in uh, how many short-term rentals are located near a requested location. The Zoning Board has already asked us to provide a map, um, or the planning staff, a map of where the nearby short-term rental locations are. So this just allows them to consider how many others are nearby. What it also does is it codifies the process that the Zoning Board of Adjustment uses today, uh, and then makes a little bit of a change when it comes to the renewal process. So the Zoning Board does a first-year probationary period with 30 nights, and they say, okay, you've got a three-bedroom house and a two-vehicle driveway, so you get six adults, two vehicles, um, no more than 30 nights in your first year. Uh, we're going to codify that process, but we will make it easier and say that after the first year, staff does an audit, and we already do this today, and we look at verified complaints and violations, and if there are none, that's an administrative renewal. Uh, they don't have to go back to the Zoning Board of Adjustment for additional uh, approvals. We, as staff, will administratively say, yes, you are good to go up to your maximum 40 night, 45 nights a year, keep the number of adults and vehicles. If you want to make any changes, come back to the ZBA. And that audit would happen every single year. And then what we are also proposing to change is allowing multifamily and condominium buildings outside of the tourist overlay district. And you'll remember the TOD is bounded by McFarland, 15th, Nick's Kids, and the River. And so what this would allow is uh, some of those condos on Veterans Memorial or Midtown Village to have up to 100 licenses by right. They would just come and apply, get their license, um, just like folks in multifamily and apartment built or in condominium buildings do in downtown. Anything more than 100 licenses goes as a special exception. We haven't even hit 100 multifamily or condo licenses within the downtown area. So outside, I, we don't anticipate any issues or an onslaught, long story short. Uh, so just to be able to hit a quick compare and contrast on these, uh, you'll see, again, no changes in that tourist overlay downtown campus district. The process outside will change for that probationary year in the first year, and then administrative renewal if there are no certified or verified complaints or violations. 
they go back up to the permitted by right 45 nights. Historic district properties are the same. And then for multifamily and condo, we just spoke about that piece. So remember this will maintain and add just an additional special exception primary criteria that number seven at the bottom that the noise ordinance shall be adhered to. And what this does, especially for staff in that audit process is if there are noise complaints where TPD has responded to somebody um, and, and had to shut down a party or had to shut down something, our staff can say, nope, you had a noise complaint on this date and this date. It was verified TPD you know, said they had to shut, shut down a party. We use that with our audit and that will help us a lot. And then the special exception discretionary criteria we have rearranged, I know you probably got to see in the red line version, a lot of strike through. Uh, everything is being maintained. We just reordered in uh, to make sure we were hitting the city council's priorities. Uh, and so we've also added in that whether or not short-term rental is the primary or accessory use of the dwelling and that addition in number three. Uh, this came out of administration and policy yesterday with their recommendation to you to recommend back to them. Um, but do you have any questions for me? I have a question. Um, prime, the, uh, making it a discretionary criteria about whether it's a primary or accessory use. I mean, is that because, I mean, I don't understand why that could not be just, if it's, if it is a, an accessory use, you you can't have a short-term rental there. I don't understand how they're, you know, discretionary leaves them wide open. And it seems like to me that, you know, one application could be approved and then the next one not allowed and then the next one approved. I don't understand how, your, what criteria makes it discretionary. Discussions with the city attorney's office and with administration and policy committee over the last three months or so, um, we had talked about it possibly being an all or nothing situation. Uh, that opens us up to a lot of opportunity to be challenged uh, in court and possibly lose, especially in relation to what happened in New Orleans. We don't want that for what is honestly, and this is credit to you as a planning commission as well, but we have very much a model ordinance that other communities have used and are looking at adding in whether it's a primary or accessory use, um, and then the addition of, in number three, the characteristics of the neighborhood and surrounding properties. Um, you could say, okay, this neighborhood is, uh, you know, the Zoning Board of Adjustment could say, all right, this neighborhood is uh, primarily owner-occupied, uh, and almost everyone in here is a homestead-exempt house. And this is an investment piece of property, and we're not sure that this use, this transient use, fits in with the character of the neighborhood. Uh, and so that could be something, because it would be an accessory use, and it may not fit with the character. And so that's something now that the Zoning Board of Adjustment, they have always been able to consider. But this makes it even more clear to them. No, wait, that would be a primary use, right, if it were an investment property? If it were an investment, yes, I'm so sorry. Yeah. That it would be the primary use right. would be short-term rental. And Thank yet you. there might be owner-occupiers there mm -hmm. who would lease for short terms for events. Sure. And that would be an accessory use. Yes. Okay. Like if you, if, if you owned your, if I, if I rented out my home that I owned, that would be an accessory thing because I'm there right. most of the time. Yes. So that is, this is the safest mm -hmm. way for us to do it. Uh, lacking challenge. And I guess number three would sort of <clears throat> influence maybe the decisions made on number two? It could, Like yes, determining whether, and I mean, mm -hmm. to me, it, it's either primary or accessory. I'm sorry, I just think no, that's, that's, that's sort of, you know, do you live there? Mm -hmm. Okay, well that's, you know, then your short-term rental will be accessory to your primary residence. Mm -hmm. So, I guess I'm just having a hard time. I guess, I mean, I haven't read the case that you're talking about, but oh. I, I'm having a hard time. It, to me, it's either one or the other. But it, it is. You're absolutely correct. It is one or the other, but yeah. we can't make the determination that says short-term rentals can only be in owner-occupied homes. Yeah. So because of that, we've written it this way.
Any other questions for me? I'm just going to address the reason we had the moratorium. I mean, is that this is this yes, came sir. Out and that. actually, the city council. Uh, so December twentieth, we got the feedback from the council about the direction they wanted us to draft the amendments in. And that night, they actually suspended the rules and uh, lifted the moratorium on short-term rentals that night. And so the, the new application ban was lifted that evening. So, anything else for me? Do we need to take a This is a public, vote? it is a public hearing. So okay. um, if there's folks here to speak for or against. Okay. Uh, any, any questions of staff before we open the public? Anyone in the audience care to speak uh, on this matter, for or against? Okay, having heard none. Ms. Christ, do we need to take a little... I'm going to recuse myself. You're going to recuse? Okay. Do you want us to take a voice vote, pass it back to council? Uh, since it's a zoning text amendment, if you'll roll call vote, or not roll call vote, but run the table and okay. um, vote it that way. All right. Yes, sir. All right, Commissioner, you've heard from uh, Ms. Crikes about the amendments to the article of the zoning ordinance for short-term rental. Uh, do I have a motion to approve? Motion. motion. Second. Mr. Uh, Ms. Harris? Yes. 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 Motion approved. Good evening, Commission. We do have one case requesting to continue this evening. It is S-10422, the resurvey of Camp Subdivision, and the petitioner is here to make that request. Petitioner. Hello, I'm Adam Ingram with PPL in Tuscaloosa, 3516 Greensboro Avenue. And on behalf of the owner, I would like to ask that this case be continued. Is anyone in the audience here to speak for or against this petition? Okay, having heard none. Commission before us, we have a continuous request for S10422. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, ayes have it. All right, Commission, we do have one case continued from last month, and that is S9622. This is the resurvey of Elliott Estates. It's consisting of three residential lots on approximately 13 acres. It's located at 180 and 242 Patriot Parkway, and this is not in city limits. Here is the vicinity map. It's in between Patriot Parkway North and Old Marion Road, just down the street from Hillcrest High School. Aerial view of that property, it's currently two lots. They would like to go to three. This is the plot with contours. And without, lot one is remaining as is, and they are splitting lot two into two lots, creating three. They're requesting sidewalks, capped sewer, as well as additional right-of-way along Old Marion Road. And they have a letter from the county engineer stating that they will not um, require them to build out the sidewalks or dedicate additional right-of-way. Engineering? Oh, we're okay with the request. Okay. Petitioner? Chairman, members of the commission, Bobby Herndon, uh, thank you for granting us this opportunity. As we discussed partially at last meeting, we're wanting to make three lots out of two lots. We had a little confusion with uh, the owners, but uh, we'd like to go ahead and get uh, approval of the preliminary plat. At some point on the final plat, we're going to limit that there to be a, a mobile home on lot number two. Uh, some of the property owners were concerned about the mobile home part, but that's not going to be taking place so we can handle that. Final plan. I think this is actually a question for staff, but that we had the, the condition on lot one about the sidewalks. Should lot two ever be developed, lot one, they would have to put sidewalks across one and two. Are we going to leave that in place and wait on development to decide about that? At, at the time, that was brought up, Commissioner, that, um, of course, I'm, I'm not speak for the staff, but we didn't know that the county wasn't going to recognize or even let us or maintain sidewalks through that. Right. I guess my question is whether we need to do anything administratively oh, yes, about that requirement on the on the plat. So you approving this plat would effectively remove that note. Okay. And okay. All right, good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And that was from the months ago. 
case we had, we put that on. For the years. Yeah, yeah, for good <laughs> years. It was like months. But. <laughs> any, any questions for our petitioner? Anyone here to speak? Okay, we do have to do a sign up for this. Mr. Chairman, I have uh, Tom and Judy Perry. Tom? <laughs> Uh, I'm Tom Perry, and I live at 243 Patriot Parkway, and uh, I don't want the lots below me developed into a mobile home park. No way. Okay. And uh, if they would, they would have to put a sidewalk up, supposedly, and that would be a stumbling block, and that might keep people from doing it, and I'd like for that to stay there because we've already got it down. And I don't want to give up nothing. Okay. So I don't, I, I don't, it doesn't make any difference if the county will take care of it or not. I mow all of mine anyway, and I could mow more if I have to. But I, I don't, I want stipulations because if I don't, you don't know what it's going to do in years to come. I know I'm not going to live that long, but I still don't want it done. I understand. <laughs> well, wait, Mr. The, the petitioner here has stated that there's going to be on the plat no mobile homes. I said earlier on, on the plat there will be a condition that will not be a mobile home. Right. It will be one recorded. One single mobile home allowed on lot number two. That's right. fine. That's right. fine. Okay. No problem with that. Okay. Thank you, sir. We appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, the next person is um, Amy McKnight. Amy McKnight? Oh. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Chairman, the last person is Julie Cook. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. So apparently we've gotten to a, a good place, correct? <laughs> all right. Anyone else care to speak for or against this petition request? Okay. Having heard none, any commissioners want to have any comments? I know there was a question about the sidewalk, and I think we're clear on that. We're clear no, it on looks the, like it. they took did some hard work and yep, worked this out. And I got, appreciate that. Uh, exactly. So, not any questions or comments from commission. Commission before us, we have. Okay. All right, commission before us, we have a request for S9622, a resurvey of Elliott Estates. Engineering uh, has approved the variance request of sidewalks, cap sewer, and additional right of way. However, we would like to have it conditioned upon the. Um, on the final plat, the recording of the no mobile homes on the lots, correct? If that being said, do I have a motion and a second? Motion, motion to approve. Second. Mr. Rumsey. Yes. 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 Motion approved. All right, Commission, this evening we have three companion cases for you, and we'll begin with companion case A. It consists of a PUD amendment, annexation, and rezoning. We'll wait just one moment. All right, we'll go ahead and continue. We'll begin with that PUD amendment. The PUD that we are referencing will be Hillcrest Gardens. This is P0309, part two. This is an amendment to an existing planned unit development to remove two lots for a total of 69 residential lots. This is on approximately 16 acres located at 9200 Highway 69 South. And this is not in city limits. Here's the vicinity map. You've got Shelton State to the west. And here's an aerial view. The two pieces that they're requesting to remove from this PUD are highlighted in red. And here's that master plan that was adopted back in 1996. This was built out in four phases, and the fourth phase was never recorded. I'll try and outline that for you. 
it'll follow along that way. There was one lot that was platted and recorded as of phase four, and that is lot 33. The rest was left unplatted and undeveloped. And on the left is that final plat that references lot 33. <clears throat> and within their restrictive covenants, they went on to say that in the event that governmental regulations or economic conditions make the completion of the development of additional phases thereof impossible, unprofitable, or unreasonable, then the declarants may, at their option, terminate the effect of those restrictive covenants as to such real property for which a map or plat has not been recorded. Do you have any questions on the amendment before we jump into the annexation? Mr. Woodson, would you want to kind of clarify for the commission and, the, and those in attendance the legality of this completion of development? It's, it's, it's up to this board as to whether they want to grant uh, an amendment to that put. I think you just listen to both sides and, and weigh whether it's justified or not based on what was initially uh, granted and what was reasonable expectation of those who bought houses versus what has changed and what they're requesting to do now. Okay. Any questions for, for staff? Thank you. All right. Moving forward, we have annexation 323, still referencing those two parcels. They would like to annex them into city limits. It's approximately 3.78 acres and again located at 9200 Highway 69 South. Here's where we are in the property. A framework identified this as a primary expansion area, and it's identified as a split of corridor commercial and suburban residential. Uh, this is due to city services to conduct commercial business. This is tied to a rezoning. They would like to come in as a, re as a uh, commercial property. Going through, we identified framework as we're looking through this annexation petition. We sent it on to other departments in the city, and the Office of the City Engineer and City Attorney had no issues. Environmental services stated that services will not be provided. Moving into that rezoning, we have ZO323. Taking that, those same two pieces we've been referencing, they would like to, if annexed, rezone to BN. Any annexation piece does come in defaulted as R1, so they would like to rezone to BN. This is where we are. And here is that property. To the north of it, you have the public shopping center zoned BN. And to the south, you have undeveloped land still located in the county. Um, this is due to it being economically unfeasible to build out the rest of Hillcrest Gardens, so they would like to use these properties as commercial. And here is a site plan showing what that site could look like. Uh, they would be required a buffer. They are not connecting into Hillcrest Gardens. They're accessing off of 69 South. They've got their dumpster enclosure to the southwest portion of the development. And they also have a note on here stating that lighting would not shine towards the residential neighbors behind them. Here's an elevation of what that landscaping buffer could and would look like. Also, it's hard to see, but behind the trees, they do also have a fence that they would be constructing. And this is that fence. And this is a view from the existing Hillcrest neighborhood facing 69 South. Um, this does conform to framework. It does, uh, it was identified as corridor commercial. Also split with the suburban residential stated previously. And here are those permitted uses within BN. Now the petitioner has given us a presentation for you all this evening, um, but before they come up, do you have any questions for staff? Let me, Jimbo, back to the, back to the original PUD question with regard to the economic feasibility. Is that, is that, is that normal in PUD language, or is that something that was put in this one? I don't think it's in, I'd have to go back, I don't think it's in the ordinance, but that's just been in those standard questions for years. I mean, that, that, is that pretty standard? And all, all it would be was somebody would say, you know, in the presentation, yes, we have the feasibility to do it, we have financing, that kind of thing. And somebody get up and say, we hope to do it in the future if we get financing, then you would say, hey, why don't you come back when you get financing? Okay. When, when was that recorded by chance? When was that? 
was it 96? Uh, 96? 96? 96, that's right. Okay. Any comments? One more thing to note before we have the petitioner come up. If you all, once we get to the voting, um, if you all do vote to amend this PUD, we ask that the wording would be that it's a condition based on the annexation and rezoning being approved by council. Um, that's, that's what we have. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right, petitioner. Good evening, my name is Brian Winter and I live at 7234 Commodore Drive, Northeast in Tuscaloosa. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, members of the board, thank you for listening tonight. Uh, this is an interesting presentation because effectively I have to prove a negative and some, something you can easily do, but having done a bunch of research on this, I wanna share some ideas with you and what's, what, what is going on here. So we'd like to remove these two parcels from the PUD. It's approximately 3.18 <coughs> acres. Uh, the subdivision was to build, be built in phases. The areas of the fourth phase were never platted, and the covenants provide specifically that they need not be built. Uh, everybody who bought a lot in the covenant, everybody who bought a lot or a home in this, in this subdivision since 1996 has been aware of those covenants. We'd also like to annex into the city. We come in as an R1, but we'd like to change that to a BN to go along with the framework plan. So I can make this work now. Here's the covenant, here's the actual covenant, and it's hard to see it on that, but it does say 1996. And with each phase, those covenants were re-filed re, uh, and provided, they, and theoretically they're on notice and provided to a homeowner before they purchase it. And so what that covenant says, if it's economically unreasonable for the declarants to proceed, they have the right not to determine the restrictions, and thereafter they should not be obligated to, to complete future phases of the development. You'll see that last line, it says, and thereafter, the clearance shall not be obligated to complete future phases of development. So that's exactly what the owners did. And you can see here, in November 29th, 2022, we filed a seven page notice of termination and filed it with the probate judge as required by the covenants. Um, and although the covenants don't require it, we did in fact have two meetings with the neighborhood to discuss this matter. And I wanna take you through some of the things there. But the bottom line on this is, and having talked to numerous builders about whether you could ever build homes there at this point, is it's not economically possible to do that. And I'll take you through the numbers on that. So first thing I want you to notice here, these are the market prices of sales for homes in this subdivision. These are garden homes. They range everywhere from 1,300 square feet to 2,141 2, square feet, okay? The lots are usually 50 foot wide. But if you'll take it there and you look at the amount sold and then you take the size of the square foot, you can see the amounts that they were sold for. The highest square foot dollar of the lots was $142.12. And that's a number that's important to remember. Now, what I've learned through the course of this is that the bigger the house you build, oftentimes the less it costs because you could have a three bedroom, two bath house, which would still have all the appliances, all the electrical, everything else. But if you built a bigger house, the lumber is gonna be cheaper, but you'll still have the same appliances in it. If you're in a smaller house, you have less lumber, less insulation, less roofing, but you still have all the appliances. So those fixed costs, a smaller house will oftentimes cost more than a slightly larger house. And that plays out in this example. If you'll see the bottom number there at 1101 Periwinkle, that's the biggest house that was sold during this time, and that was $130.31, and that was sold in October of last year. Now, why is it economically unfeasible? Well, over the course of the last year, and frankly, since the beginning of the pandemic, the cost involved in construction, especially residential construction, but of course, commercial construction, has gone through the roof. And I'm not making a pun there, it really has. It's been unprecedented. So first, the cost of infrastructure. And we talk about infrastructure, we talk about dirt work, mobilizing all your things, putting pipes in, sanitary sewer, stormwater sewer, everything that needs to be done there, that's gone up, and I'll show you the specific example of that. Concrete, one of the builders told me yesterday that he got a notice that January 1, concrete was going up $20 a yard. That's a huge increase. Usually you might see a two or $3 increase, but $20 a yard. Lumber was way up, now it's come down to what they call a seasonal high. Roofing is way up, plumbing, electrical, HVAC appliances and windows have all gone through the roof. Now, typically, you don't want to work unless you have a profit. 
And what builders do is they take approximately 8 to 12% profit. I split it in half and put 10. And then I've also put in the overhead. Builders pay their overhead like their insurance and things by adding that on to the cost of the home. Then you got to have somebody sell the home, which is usually at 6%. The other thing that's happened in the last year due to inflation, as you saw, the Federal Reserve has raised mortgage interest rates from 3.1% to over 7%, and now they're down a little bit uh, high sixes. But what that means is there's less purchasing power due to the higher mortgage rates, okay? So if I wanted to buy a house for $300,000, my mortgage might have been $1,200 or $1,000 two year, a year ago. But now, instead of being at 3.1%, the rate is 66 And now my mortgage is actually $600 more a month. Now, that means my taxes are also more and my insurance are, is also more. So all these things add up. Remember, if you have a $600 higher mortgage payment, you got to take taxes out, so that means, and these houses are for the working folks or maybe retirees, that means you'd have to make like $750 or $800 more a month just to cover the mortgage after taxes are being taken out. How many of us know people who are working folks who go out and work every day, make a living, and might want to buy something in here that have, an, that have made an extra $800 a month on an hourly wage for the last year? It's very unlikely. So why are costs so high? Substantial increase in inflation and construction costs. Labor costs have also gone through the roof. The Tuscaloosa employment rate, unemployment rate was 2.4% in November. That's according to the Department of Labor, Alabama. There's a smaller pool, talent pool in, in home building after the Great Recession. The baby boomers are aging out. This was an interesting statistic. Now that I'm over 50, one in five construction laborers is over 50. So they're aging out. And other industries, especially in Tuscaloosa, like logistics and manufacturing, are taking people away. It's easier to drive a truck may be easier to work on the line at a supplier than to go build a house, okay? COVID-19 pandemic restrictions caused all sorts of supply chain disruptions, and then the war in Ukraine made fuel prices go through the roof, and of course, again, the era of cheap money is over because of the increased rate. So you talk about cost of construction. Uh, this is from the St. Louis Fed. A lot of the builders look at this. If you'll see on the, on the left side here, it says April 2020, which is the month basically that the um, pandemic started, the, uh, the number was 215.2. November of this year, it was up to 312.73. That's an increase of 47% in, uh, in residential construction goods. 47%. That's a lot of increase. And they have to pass that along. So what does that mean? Well, that means, for example, we had TTL do the estimate of what the infrastructure would cost. And the infrastructure, after TTL did it, said it would be about a million dollars, a million three thousand dollars. Now, we had looked at this once before, four, or five, four years ago, three years ago, and it was about seven hundred thousand dollars. So TTL does this regularly. I think that's a pretty good estimate. And our member of our team, Adam, is right there. Adam Ingram, he can answer any questions about that. So originally, when we looked at doing this, and I think it's on your plat, we had looked at adding 16 lots. When we were looking at it this time, we went back and we decided we were going to try and put 19 lots there and make them a little bit smaller. The reason why is because if we take that million dollars in infrastructure and we apply it to 16 lots, it's $62,000 of infrastructure per lot. And then if we, add nine, if we did 19 lots, it lowers the infrastructure price, okay? Now, here's the problem, and I've had for the chairman and the vice chairman have received letters from Caitlin Giles saying that they've gotten two builders, and I, if I had some more time, I would get some more. But basically, the cost to build a home, a garden home, a quality garden home, is $165 a square foot right now. That does not include certain things. That's just the base price for the construction materials. It does not include the cost of the lot. It does not include overhead and profit. It does not include construction financing. It does not include the realtor price, okay? So if we were to start this and look at these calculations on Hillcrest Gardens with that 1,688 square foot house that we talked about in the beginning, if we ran those prices out and put overhead and profit, the, the construction alone at $165 a uh, square foot, oops, excuse me, you can look on the screen there, would be $278,000. Then the overhead and profit at 20% is $33. That's $198 per square foot just the house. Then the lot price. Now, we don't know what the lot prices were going to be down in Pruth in, in this subdivision in that area, but I took the tax assessed value of $25,000, which they all are. If these houses were to sell at this higher price, those property taxes would be significantly more. 
plus the infrastructure price, which we just talked about, is the uh, $1 million divided by 19, which comes to 52. So the lot price going in is $77,000. So you add those together and you throw in 6% for the realtor, and what you're looking at is a $436,000 house at $258 a square foot, which sounds like a lot, but this is for an 1,100, a 1,688 square foot house. Now, this is not in a subdivision where there's amenities. This is not in a subdivision that's off quiet someplace. This is a subdivision, and these houses would back up to Highway 69, okay? And you're in a subdivision that is next to an elementary school, which is already over, overcrowded, according to the county schools, okay? So there, there are... There are a lot of issues with selling a house there to begin with when you can buy houses in other areas and other sections. Right now, the north side of Tuscaloosa is taking off, off of Northport. So that number is realistically what it would cost to build that house. Now, let me tell you what I did just to show that this doesn't work. Well, let's say the, uh, Dr. Pruthy decides to give the lots away. And let's say that TPL screwed this up by 50%. The infrastructure is only $500,000. Well, if you do that, and Dr. Pruthie gives the lots away, you take those things out, it still comes to $226.41. And the price of the house is $382,000. Now, remember, that house sold, that house sold for $239,000. So now you're going to sell a house right next to the highway for $382,000? When the house sold last July for, for $239,000, I don't think that's going to be able to happen. And I, I think that you all probably know that that won't happen. So if we go back on the other side, I took the bigger house, because the bigger houses cost less per square foot, and I put in the $165. And if we take all those calculations down, it would be a 531,000 square foot house. Oops, excuse me. And it sold previously for $279,000. If, again, if I go to the bottom right, the calculations on Hillcrest Gardens completion, if I took that and gave them the lot for free and cut the infrastructure in half because Adam's really bad at math, it would still be $222 a square foot, which equals a $477,000 house when those houses are selling. And that same house sold in October for $279,000. And these are legit because, like, yesterday I called, a, I called one of the builders. I said, how much you building prices out for. He said it's 225 to 240. And you have a letter about that from Mr. Trick, Trick Construction, and Crawford Nixon, who've both been in this business as long as anybody in town. <clears throat> so those are the differences there. Now, just so you know it's not feasible, what I did here was for the 1,688 square foot house, which is a smaller house but got the highest dollar per square foot, I put this into a spreadsheet and I went backwards. So at the bottom, I put the sales price of that house from July of 22, which is $239,000, and that's $142 a square foot. Then I backed out the realtor cost, and you can see that, $14,000. That gave us a total of $225,000. Then I backed out the lot price and the infrastructure price, which gave us a, total, which gave us a price of $147,000 for the house. Then I backed out the overhead. And then I backed out the construction, when we, I got backed out the overhead, it got down to $123,000 for that house. But if you look to the right of that, it says $73. Okay, I've probably lost everybody, but the bottom line on this thing is, is that you cannot build a house for $73 in January 23. Now, just to show you how bad you can't do it, even if we didn't use a realtor to sell it, we didn't have anything for the lot price. Adam screwed up the, the infrastructure price by 50%, and the builder didn't take any profit. Now, do you know any builders that are going to work like that and not take a profit? But even if we did all that, the only amount that would be left to actually purchase the materials for construction is $126.53. You can't build a house on that. It's $165. But even if you could build it for $126,000, no builder's going to do it without a profit. Nobody's going to give a lot away. The infrastructure's going to be right, and you're going to have to have a realtor. And the bottom line is, what bank is going to finance this house if those are the numbers? Again, we did the same thing, the same thing on the largest home here. This is a 2141 house. We took the sales price from October 
put the 130 in and backed it out, and it was $71.86 a square foot for the construction materials, not 165. Then we back, we did it again, assuming that the builder did it for free, no lots, no realtor, and the infrastructure was half. And it still cost two, and it still only got $118 for construction costs, which means they can't build it. Okay? So those numbers are all clear. We've run this on multiple times at multiple things, but this is the best situation and the worst situation. And neither way, it works. Now, the record increases in mortgages. Has anybody tried to refinance their home or, or buy a new home? Okay. Well, on 12-30-21, according to the St. Louis Fed, the average mortgage was 3.11%. If you had a $300,000 mortgage, 30-year standard mortgage, it would be $1,283 a month. $1,283 a month. This year, if you bought, got a mortgage on the last couple days of the year, it would be 6.42%. The monthly payment on that $300,000 would be $1,880. That's an increase of 3.31%, 3, 3, 3 and that's an increased monthly payment of $600. That means you have to make $700 more a month to cover that extra extra payment. Plus, when you buy a house at the higher price, your taxes are going to be higher, and also your insurance is going to be higher. What this means with the mortgage rates is, even if people could buy the houses at the current price, they, wouldn't, they might not be able to do it because they have less purchasing power. So you have higher costs with lower purchasing power, which is a problem. And it may not have hit us yet, but it's coming. So we had two meetings with the neighborhood. The first one was constructive. They gave us their list of issues that they didn't want to have at the neighborhood. And I think we've put them all in here. First, they wanted the grassy area, the grassy area to stay grass. We did that. Then they didn't want the dumpster pad loaded back here where it was, so we moved it up here. They wanted directional lighting into the back, and we can do, not into the back of their houses, we can do that. And I talked to staff, and I think code would require that. And they wanted a good buffer between the neighborhood and development, including a fence, and not a wood fence, and trees and bushes. And we've done all that. Now, the closest it gets are these two areas right here that you see, and you're like, what are those? The staff wants us to put in turnarounds for fire trucks and garbage trucks. And that's what those are there for. But we still have plenty of border as required by the code. They wanted to see a visual of our plans. We gave it to them. They wanted to see calculation of how we determined the construction of another phase was not reasonable. We gave them the base numbers on that. We didn't give all the detail here, but we basically gave them the numbers. And they want the city to enforce the above requirements, including the maintenance of the fence. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. The second meeting, not so constructive. Basically, I tried to explain this, and, and I, I understand these folks' passion. They live there. That's their home. It's important to you. It's their biggest investment they've ever made. But basically it was, no, we don't want you to build anything but houses there, and you ought to just not even go up there. And that was it. Now, some people still came up and asked questions, and we discussed it, but there were certain members who were extremely vocal and very passionate. I totally get it, and I respect it. And they asked me some questions that I had to think about. Now, one of the reasons that, they, that some of the neighbors expressed about the issues about making this commercial is because of the issues they've had with Publix over the years. As you know, that's the Capitol Center. It's a big public supermarket. And what they described to us were trucks arriving 24 hours a day. And right in here, you know, is, is part of their neighborhood here. So they hear everything that comes this way. Okay? And so they, were, they said, you know, trucks come in at night to load and unload. And these aren't little trucks. These are, come on, I don't know why it won't clear. Um, these aren't little trucks. These are 18-wheelers. And then they have a dumpster there that sometimes gets picked up in the middle of the night. You know they clang. Um, you also, they have a wooden privacy fence there. I guess it's about 10 or 12 feet high, but they didn't expect it to be a wooden privacy fence. And it's constantly in a state of disrepair, and it doesn't get fixed very often. And then they said that this area in between, put it right in here, this area in between where the retention pond is and this area here, it doesn't really get taken care of, and they've had animals and pests and rodents coming into their neighborhood from there. Nobody would want that, and I agree with you on there. And I, and, but I do think, and maybe one of the ladies can help me here clear this, I do think the issue is, though, that this is a different kind of proposal we're doing. 
So in the two meetings with the neighborhood, excuse me, I pushed the wrong button. In the two meetings of the neighborhood, they wanted a fence and they wanted bushes. And as you can see, the plan is if, this, if and when this gets built, we're going to put the evergreens, I think they're junipers, an Italian juniper. I'm not sure exactly the name. I'm not really good with plants. And the trees in there. And that's actually, this, this actually here, this uh, rendering was done by Jordan Morris, and it reflects the drawing that you saw earlier, the actual layout. From, oh, excuse me, sorry. And so from the neighbor's side of the property, this is what you would see. Now, they don't want a wooden fence. I don't think we could put a wooden fence up there. I think it's either got to be solid or it's got to be brick. But it can't be just a slat wooden fence as a privacy fence. So what we have here is a solid fence with the bricks in between. Um, and that's an example of what would have to be used. So I think we've answered that for them. This is what we conceive of out front. And this is what, exactly what Framework's talking about, neighborhood commercial. And that's why we said BN. And, and, and ladies and gentlemen, one of the um, residents asked me this really good question. And, and I really wasn't sure. And I said, no, I, I don't think I would be concerned about the commercial up front. Because, and, and, and I had a couple reasons for it, but as I was driving home that night, the reason that hit me was is that at the towns of North River, which is probably the most successful subdivision in the county over the last 10, 15 years. They're actually building commercial out front. And it's actually become an amenity to the community. First of all, they've got a wonderful little restaurant and coffee house. They have a dentist. They have a doctor coming in. They have a church. They have all these different things that people are using, and they and their kids can ride their bike to it or walk to it. The second part is, if they had put something else up in there, it would have been more people and more cars driving in and out of the neighborhood and not a good spot, okay? Now, that's a little different, but I really think that the commercial has a lot of appeal, especially as people want to drive less and walk more. And we talk about connectivity here. So in this, it could be a pharmacist, it could be a doctor or a dentist, it could be a coffee house. And I might say in five or 10 years, if this is developed and built out, somebody might ultimately want to put a gate there so they could walk over and get a cup of coffee in the morning. I don't know, but I do know that things are changing about that. And being able to walk to things and having neighborhood stores is important. You see this in a lot of nice areas in America. You see it in Atlanta in some of the nicer subdivisions, um, the Highlands, the Atlanta Highlands. So I, I, I understood what they were saying, but after a deep reflection, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. So after, with respect to that, that's, that's my story as to, number one, the affordability and the feasibility economically. And again, it's hard to prove a negative but I feel very confident, especially concerned with, especially with respect to the builders I have, and the, even the two letters I have there, that it's not economically feasible. As a matter of fact, Dr. Pruthi even has talked about every builder saying, hey, you want to buy lots? If we did this, would you buy lots? He's gotten zero positives back on it. Um, as a matter of fact, Mr. Crawford Nixon, who signed one of those letters, said, yeah, Dr. Pruthi told me about that last year, and I tried to do the numbers on it, and it just doesn't work. So, uh, and then the second part is what we did with respect to the neighborhood's concerns. The third part is the zoning. Of course, you know, we come in as R1. And I think, as Caitlin very well said, that there's BN there. This is corridor commercial. That's county to the south of us. It's a huge open field. I would think that they would want to come in as well as commercial. And then down the highway a little more, you have the BH zoning. So I think BN fits. And with that, thank you for listening. If you have any questions, I know some of that may have been a little confusing. But the bottom line is, it's not economically feasible. This is a positive use of the property. It'll be done well. It'll be done right, because the staff is going to make them do right. You know that. And the last thing is, it needs to come in as BN, because that's really the only viable use for this property. Now, the, the, I know that the neighbors are going to get up. I'd like to have a little time to respond to some of their questions if they come up and ask mm -hmm. that. But thank you for listening. Does anybody have any questions? Mr. Rumsey. So if the uh, builders, are, the costs have gone up. Excuse me? The, the builder's costs have gone up to build yeah. the houses. So what about the commercial? Has the cost gone up for commercial? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the answer to that. I haven't checked into that. It's a great question. But I think that there's been, I, I know that Dr. Pruthi has had some interest from people who would like to get commercial there. Um, and I know the people next door are interested in putting that parcel together, the one next door. Are you uh, going to do anything to protect the, um, the, the, the landowners here from nuisance type? stores, you know, for instance, payday loans and 
well, smoke I, I, shops I, I, and things like that. I thought that under the, the jurisdiction of the city, once it's in the planning jurisdiction, you all can control that anyway. Um, so I think that's covered there. I may be wrong, and if I am, I think that they should be protected. So, so they don't have to worry about nuisance, nuisance so, business. Yeah, that's the purpose of re, of zoning is the but B I mean, and as far as what, would as far be. as I know, there's a long list of things. That yeah, yeah. Specifically, uh, I'm looking at what BN zoning allows. Packaged liquor store is allowed. Um, other than that. Can you buy a bong in the? Can you can you sell bongs in a shop? <laughs> we don't have that specific use in our zoning ordinance. But. So, 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 Mr. Harrison, has his construction costs gone up in the commercial sector? Well, sure. I mean, I mean, the same concrete goes in the, in the house; it goes in the building. So, so, so you would think that maybe you'd have the same challenge to, to build a commercial venture. I don't know. I just. <clears throat> Any other questions? So, do you think that we'll, we'll ever build another house adjoining another neighbor? Uh, Excuse no, me, you, sir. You made out a very compelling Ivory League, you know, argument. Oh. I'm very proud of you. I know it's expensive to go to those fancy schools. And all there we go. So, um, <laughs> but but according to your argument, we'd never build another house anywhere. No, that's not necessarily true. There are some housing places going up, but they're not. There's some differences, and there are some preliminary plats the neighbors asked about. Uh, but I think there's some real differences between 19 lots and when you're building 200 lots or 150 lots, there's some economies of scale, especially when you're doing, um, when you have that number of houses. And it also goes into what you're putting up. You know, uh, there are numerous builders right now that even if, well, let me explain this. Uh, right now, the way the economy is, a lot of builders have bought land and really nobody expected, it seems, this inflation that we've had this last year, especially the mortgage rates. And the mortgage rates rising has been historic. Um, the highest mortgage rates we ever had were in 1986, and Paul Volcker took over for Reagan and slammed the tight money policy in. That was the highest. These aren't the highest. They've now returned to historically normal spots. But compared to where we've been since basically 2008, this has been the largest quick jump up here. And that's going to slam these brakes on the economy. Now, the reason I say that, Mr. Rumsey, is because people have planned things. And we may not know yet whether they will come to fruition or whether they will sell. I think several builders, and I know several builders who are doing this, that have planned, have gotten plats, and now they're sitting on a piece of land which may, they may have several million dollars in, and instead of paying a variable rate of 4%, now they're up at 8 and they're eating that. So they just want to build enough to get out of the bank. All right, so, so you, you spend a lot of time running the feasibility on the residential. Have you done as much, have you spent as much time running the feasibility on the commercial? No, sir. Well, Why not? Because that wasn't in the covenants. It doesn't say, with all well, due respect, that, and, that whether it's feasible. So you, don't, so you don't know whether there's, do you know whether there's vacancies in these strip centers that are running up and down 69 or not? In other words, the, well, it, the, are, there's not many vacancies. I mean, you're betting the farm on building a new strip center, right? Yeah. I, I don't think there's a lot of vacancies in the Capital Market Center because I have a couple clients in there. And I drive down there from time to time, and it doesn't seem to be anything vacant. As a matter of but fact, but you're not going to you're not going to build a commercial center without knowing, right? I mean, because you you've got you've got a lot of studying on knowing what it will cost to build a residential house. That's absolutely right. So, so you're saying that you you want to rule out your possibility of ever building houses? Is that that's what well, you're asking for? Right? right now, what we want to do is take it out of the pod so we can at least explore those opportunities. And you're saying it costs two or three hundred thousand dollars a foot to build a house because it costs a million dollars to put in a sewer line? Is that what? You're is that what you're saying? Well, the the one point the one million three thousand is the estimated cost for nineteen houses. Mm -hmm. So, and it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I don't know ultimately what will happen with the economy and with the mortgage rates. They may come down. We may have to bring them back down. But when you put four trillion dollars into the economy due to COVID, but you don't you can't share with us. You can't guarantee us that if you build this center that it'll be successful because you don't have the numbers on what you've done to make sure that'll be successful. So if you build this center next door to these people and it fails and they have to start renting it for next to nothing, they're gonna get all sorts of all sorts of businesses in there that maybe they won't be well, coming Mr. over Rumsey, there to sip Mr. coffee. And Mr. Rumsey, you, there's always a lot of things that can happen, but I would say this. I think you all approved the Tuscaloosa Forward Plan, correct? This body did, and it was approved by the city council. And under that plan, which you approved, this is supposed to be corridor commercial. So it may not happen today. It may not happen next year. 
I remember when I moved here, once you got past the little gas station on Rice Mine Road, there was nothing but trees. So you got to the Yacht Club. Now there's nothing but houses and cars and commercial. So, you know, there was no Publix there. There were no strip malls there. There were no businesses there. That was 20 years ago, less than 20 years ago. So I think it may take 10 years till that grows down there, but it will grow. Eventually it will grow, but it's going to be commercial. That's what's in Tuscaloosa forward. So to the extent it doesn't work, I think we're in the same boat together since y'all, since you were one of the guys who approved that, I think it would make sense to make it commercial. Does that make sense? Well, it sounds awfully bleak for the residential housing community. Well, I think it is a question of residential housing community, and there have been booms or busts, but it's also bleak for the mortgage lender community. There are mortgage lenders that are laying off people left and right. The point I'm making, and you can, you can, you can point to my votes on Tuscaloosa Ford all you want to, Mr. Winter. All I'm saying is, is the exact same cost that you just estimated for those residential houses are in the same, same exact corridor for your commercial building. Their costs have gone up 47% too. So I'm, I guess what I'm saying is I'm worried about you being successful with this development that you're proposing because it could, could end up, it, I'm just pointing out that it could, could end up being something that's not positive. I, whether I voted for Tuscaloosa <laughs> Ford is really irrelevant. I, I, I'm not saying whether you voted for it. I'm just saying no, clearly, I know I know exactly what you're doing. What I'm okay. saying is clearly that the, the smart people in the room, you know, who were the professionals, came up with forward and the plan, and it says it's commercial quarter. Now, look, every it's, on, it's on Highway 69. I just think it's our job to, to debate you. I mean, look, for every minute you talk, the RP people's costs are going up. That's right. Because I know what it costs to go well, to those, thank you. Those, Ivory, those Princetons and Harvards and Yales and things like that. A University of Alabama law degree. Okay. I'm proud of it. Okay. Roll Tide. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Oh, Mr. Warren, thank you for the economics. <laughs> uh, lesson tonight. I appreciate that. I, I, I want to go to the wall and the buffer. Yeah. Uh, I want to look, look at your wall yeah. and your buffer. Come up. Can we have, bring the wall and buffer up? Yes, sir. Uh, let me do this here. I, 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 in in your, I, you said you had two meetings with the neighborhood. The first meeting, this was what was what was suggested. I think was what y'all agreed to, or you came up with. Yeah, those were the correct? concerns they had about doing it. Those were the folks who came there, and that was the concern. And I, and you had, I think you said you had Mr. Morris from Ward Scott do the design. Mr. Mr. Uh, Jordan. Jordan took the. Yeah. Let me, uh, Adam put together the. Tell me, overlay. tell me, sh show me the wall itself. Yes, the sir. Elevation of the wall. Tell me the details. You, you told me they were brick pilasters. I see those, yeah, I, I, but you I, didn't explain to me what was between the two. What's, okay. what's the material? Well, I don't know the answer to that, honestly. Um, Jordan asked if he needed to come, and I said I don't think so. But I think by code, it has to be a solid material. It can't be wood. So, you know, is it hardy board? Is it some kind of concrete form? I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I can't I answer know. that. So, but that's I'll, what we would expect it to look like. Also, I see uh, you call. I think you call them junipers in the back and. Assume that wall is approximately six to eight foot, so that looks like twelve to sixteen foot junipers. Is that is that the intent? Yeah, they'll grow that big. According they'll grow to that them. big. Yeah. How big are they going to be when they when you plant them? I don't know. I would figure six or eight. Okay. So they're they're not going to shield at that point, are they? If they're well, six I, or I, eight, I, I think they, those grow pretty pretty quickly. If I from what I have. Okay, so that that what I'm looking at is not realistic for day one. I don't think it's unrealistic. I think that's ultimately where where it'll be. I, do we, no, that's we not, need I said that's that is unrealistic for day one if they're not if they're going to grow that big, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't okay. have a problem with that. I think they grow into it. And then you said the second meeting things change. Yeah, second meeting we had more people, and there were a couple of very passionate people about don't ever build you don't can't ever build anything but homes. Okay. That's all I got. Thank you, sir. Well, hey, yeah. oh, go, you go ahead, Vince. Well, just going back to Zach. So, if this may be a being being in, it's definitely a commercial question. If it turns in these, as you showed, smaller boxes, smaller commercial spaces, could this be a large commercial spaces, i.e., which causes delivery trucks and I, things like that? You know, because that would then add to problem they have on the backside of the public. So it's a pretty small lot comparative if you look at the aerial to what Publix has. They're gonna have to meet again the buffer requirements. They're gonna have to meet the parking. So I don't 
I don't know about the logistics of how big the trucks will be for something, but some you, sort you of commercial development here. It could, instead of breaking that up into smaller commercial, it can be I, I one think, tenant and the whole rectangle. Yeah, and I, I, think, I think the right. problem you get there is if you're talking about a Target or a mini Target or a Walmart, you know, local Walmart, I don't think that's going to be near the station you put in. It's, it's only three acres and you have the buffer requirements, which okay. pushes your parking right. down. I, so, just, I just want to make sure. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think that's a possibility. <clears throat> I just want to make sure that they understand that, that that's not a possibility. So, so you don't really have any tenants yet or anything like that? No, this sir. is really just a, kind of right now, it's a dream. Well, we have people who are interested in the property. The problem is, is that, you know, they say, you know, you know, until you get it zone change, zoning change, you get it in the city, you know, we don't really want to talk about it anymore. So you know, it's a cart little the, the, the chicken or egg. So. Yeah, I just wanted, uh, regarding the fencing, what materials are required for what's shown is the white part there? They have a few different options. It can either be 35 feet uh, with no fencing, or it can be 15 feet with an opaque wall constructed at the property line, or it can be 10 feet with an opaque wall and the parking lot between the buildings and the buffer. So we don't have actual materials that are required for the fence itself. We do, yes. So no wall shall be constructed of wood, PVC, or vinyl, or an opaque wall is required. Shall be at least, at least six feet in height, constructed of masonry materials, including but not limited to brick, stucco, stone, masonry products. So we're looking at a hard wall. Here. So hard yes, wall. Okay. not so, a wood. Well, PVC, I mean, this this wall. this doesn't seem to fit what you've just read to me. Am I have I misinterpreted that? Um, I mean, you, you cementitious you, siding materials. I didn't finish the whole thing. Oh, so. I'm sorry. Yeah, Go no, on. you're yeah. fine. I I cut it off, but. The next sentence does say cementitious siding materials, cast stone, and other commercially available synthetic or simulated masonry products may be used alternatively or in combination with any of the materials listed above. So again, it is going to be not wood. It's going to be a solid fence yeah. okay. so this, this required could, by code. So this could represent the cementitious siding. Some sort is, that, is that hardy board? Or yeah. Another yeah. Word yeah. So can I can can we look at the plan view of the development? Yes, sir. Is I guess in part of this from from my standpoint is approving something, approving the unknown. And this is this is this is this the layout that will be used? Well, this is the layout that we've talked to people for, but there's no, this is conceptual. This is not, I can't sit here and tell you we've got somebody to build this and buy it right now. That's why I said it's really what comes first, the chicken or the egg. People we've talked to say, well, we can't do anything. We're not going to waste our time on it right now because, you know, you're in a pud and you, know, you, you haven't changed the zoning yet. So from an engineering standpoint, have you maxed out your square footage as I'm looking at with the, with the approved amount of parking? I believe it's there. I believe it's there. I'm going to ask Adam. I'm sorry. Adam, are we at maximum on this one? I think we cut a bunch of it. Let's see if we built something. So we actually had more parking, and we pulled some back in order to create more of a buffer. So I guess what you're saying is it couldn't be any bigger than this. So I don't think so. This is a really minor point, but how is that walkable from the neighborhood? It's not. What I was suggesting to you, <laughs> no, Ms. Hornsby, what I was suggesting to you is if the right things go in there, someday they may want a gate to walk over there. That's that was my point. Like at the towns of North River, they I put see. in a, they put in the, uh, the the muffin company. I can't I remember the name. Yeah. Southern, whatever it is, y'all might know what it is. But they have three of them now, and they have just the greatest food. I had a little sandwich from them today for lunch, and I mean, if I lived over there, I'd be walking there every Saturday and Sunday for lunch. I'm already fat though, so I'm glad I don't live over there. Mr. Winter, one last question: Why yes, are you why are you building a road to the south to nowhere there? I mean, why are you going to that expense? Building a road to the south at the, at the front entrance. That's the access road. Four. Oh, the, the, is that required? There, yeah, the people over there, the initial design, the people over there wanted us to put an access road in there for that. Uh, I, I understand they want you to, but why are you doing it? We may or may I mean, not, I, but we just. I want you to hurry this thing up tonight, but 
Uh, yeah, no, no. no I, yeah. What I'm saying is we may or may not, but we wanted to be honest and straightforward and say and that. Why, was, why would you spend the money to do that in this development? Well, because there's a two-foot slit in the front of all this property. We don't have road frontage on 69. So in order to get the road frontage on 69, we have to get that two-foot split from the people who have the property. No, 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 no. Yeah, no. I'm talking about the, 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 the road adjacent to your landscaping there. In the front. Yeah. Yes, sir. And let, yeah. me, let me show you what I mean by that. So on here, there's actually a, oh, excuse me. On here, there's actually a two foot, how wide is that thing? Two or three feet? It's like a strip, two to six feet that goes all along here, okay? That these folks reserve, the ward partnership over here reserved, okay? Reserved what? Re they, they kept the two, or foot, two foot to six okay. foot strip along between Rob's property and 69. So in order for us to get to 69 and get out, they asked us for an access road okay. over to here. Okay. Does That's that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. You traded out access for the building of road. Right. Okay. Because I, as I said, I believe that these folks are ultimately going to want to be commercial over here. And that's why I said it. Sorry if I didn't make that plain. If I didn't say that at all. So we've got quite a few people signed up. Any more questions for a petitioner before we um, start calling those who signed up? Thank you. Okay. I'm sure we'll Thank see you, you again. Thank you, Mr. Harrison. Thank, Thank you all for listening. All right. We're going to put a, uh, we have quite a few people. Mr. Woodson, you have a comment? Yes. I wanted to further clarify my answer to Mr. Harrison. The term in the PUD ordinance is financial capability report, which is not an issue. The term economic feasibility is the term in the restrictive covenants that we do not enforce and simply the grounds asserted for why the amendment should be granted. Is the term as it applies for economic feasibility? Feasibility, thank you. Yeah. Is that subjective? That's simply the petitioner's grounds that they came up with. It's not anything in our ordinance, it's just their grounds. And you can consider them however you want to. Okay. So there's not a litmus test? Right? No, nope, there's not. Okay. So those are bas basically their contractual grounds? Yes, they're saying it's, it's not possible to do this, therefore give us this relief and, and grant us this Right, support. okay. All right. Because we do have quite a few people that signed up. We'll uh, clock on those petitioners who want to speak tonight at three minutes. So that will begin. Mr. Chairman, the first person to sign up is Mr. William Pate. Name and address for the record, please. I'm William Pate. I live at 1098 Wisteria Drive in the, in the neighborhood. I'm the president of the Homeowners Association, and I'm here tonight to ask these people to come up and talk to you about that. We've tried to limit it to six people including myself, and we've, we've hired an attorney, but he was unable to be here tonight. He wrote us a letter, gave it to us yesterday, and we forwarded it to all of y'all, or brought it tonight, for all of y'all to look at. I would like to discuss his points at the end of the, these other presentations, but I've asked them to limit them, their presentations to three minutes if they could. So the first person I would request, with your permission, to come up is Mr. Adolph South, who's a retired uh, officer, police officer of Tuscaloosa and lives in our neighborhood. Thank you. My name is Adolph South. Uh, Mr. Pate said I'm a retired captain of Tuscaloosa Police Department. I also serve as the chairman of the architect committee of uh, the Hillcrest Gardens. <clears throat> Mr. Pruthie, uh, Dr. Parnett uh, Pruthie, Dr. Uh, Jane Mills, Mr. Jason Robertson was developing Hillcrest Garden in 2001 <clears throat> when my wife and I selected lot 28 uh, to build our four-bedroom house. We were assured at that time uh, by the builder and uh, Mr. Uh, Robertson and, and one of the developers that the property that joined the back of our lot would be phase four of the planned unit development and be the same type of houses as in the rest of phase one, two, and three. And we were sure there'd never be access off Highway 69 into the neighborhood. 
We were told there's a strip of land between the uh, Hillcrest Garden property and the right-of-way uh, owned by another person, and they had been assured that there would never be access across that property to our neighborhood. In 2004, there's a house built on lot 33 of, of uh, phase four. There's already been one house built in phase four on lot 33. The, uh, <clears throat> We feel like a commercial development, rather than 16 family homes in phase four, uh, as, a survey, as a survey indicates, it would uh, significantly reduce the value of our homes, increase the noise, light, and concerns. So therefore, I'm opposed to rezoning it and want to see phase four completed as we were promised. You have a, a map of the master plan, and it will show you that uh, lot 33 is in phase four. There's already been one home built in phase four. <clears throat> also, I submitted a list of a uh, petition of 33 names, on, and you should have a copy of it, of homeowners that states, we under, we've undersigned homeowners at Hillcrest Garden were promised when we built, bought our homes in Hillcrest Garden, that the area between Hillcrest Garden and Highway 69 would be phase four, with houses similar to the other houses in one, two, and three. We were also told there'd never be access to the highway uh, 69. That's 33 homeowners told the same thing that I was told when we, when we built our house in there. So, also, uh, Submitted, uh, you should have pictures, five different photographs of the type of houses that are in Hillcrest Gardens. I think you, I've submitted those pictures and I think y'all have copies of them. <laughs> this is the third time we've been up here before the Planning Commission. It was here in April the 20th, 2009, July 17, 2017. Tonight's the third time we've been before this commission. The proposed designs that you've been presenting are the same designs been presented in the past, except a few trees added to the design. At a, last Thursday night, July, uh, January 12th, the homeowners, we had a meeting with Mr. Winters uh, over at the uh, Bobby Miller Center. At that time, I, asked, I specifically asked Mr. Winters what were they planning to build? if there's assuming the zoning was changed. He was unable to tell us what they're going to build. Uh, he, he, he said all he could say it would be within the zoning requirements of whatever zoning it was rezoned to. Nor could he tell us what kind of fence going to be. If, if it was changed, he could not tell us what kind of buffer fence that would be there. You know, I feel like I feel like that I'm a victim of fraud by deception. If you look at the, the uh, definition according to uh, Black's law, uh, law Dictionary, fraud is any activity that relies on deception in order to achieve a gain. Fraud becomes a crime when it is knowingly mis misrepresentation of the truth or concealment of a material, uh, material fact to uh, induce another to act to his detriment. I almost feel like I'm a victim because to get me to buy the lot I did for been promising what was going to be built back there. So I'm not sure they ever intended to do that. I don't know. I know they had since 1996 to do that. So I urge you to deny this request and insist that they complete the uh, phase four of the plan unit development as we was promised when we invested to build our houses. So thank you, sir. Thank you. Harry McCool to speak to the We've got a sign up list. We've got to go by. We need to control the, and, the people coming up. So, but okay. Mr. McCool is next on the list. Yeah. So.
that is true, Jesus. Mary McCool, 9294 Penrose Lane. I, too, am one of the residents that was told there would be nothing but garden homes, phase four, on the land adjoining Highway 69 South. There was never any communication to homeowners that phase four would not be completed. We've been told it is not feasible to build out Hillcrest Gardens with garden homes. According to Webster's College Dictionary, the definition of feasible says, capable of being done or carried out. It also lists a synonym as possible. Last month, Barclay Garrett from the Chamber of Commerce gave a presentation related to the housing market with data provided from the UA Culver House College of Business. Using the formula for workforce housing, Hillcrest Gardens could be a perfect fit for the first time home buyers, empty nesters downsizing, and single parent families. As shown on page one, table one of the handout, the inventory to sales ratio is 2.8 months, a very low ratio. A balanced market is six months, which would be a sellers, which would not be a sellers or buyers market. This is an indicator that more homes are needed to stabilize the market. The number of days houses have been on the market was 40 for the same time period, an extremely quick turnaround for real estate. At the end of October, there were only 117 total single-family homes for sale in all of Tuscaloosa that are considered workforce housing is illustrated on page one, table two. Another indicator that more housing units are desperately needed. This inventory could be increased with the completion of phase four. Not only is it feasible, but there is a great demand. Now let's look at the housing that has sold in the 69 South area from March through mid-December 2022. See pages two, three, and four of your handout. Data was compiled using Zillow and Realtor.com with only Barton homes included. Most have sold for close to the asking price, if not more. The average days on the market was 65. The demand is very strong for this housing type, which is another economic factor of what Hillcrest Gardens could contribute to the economy. Lastly, seven new subdivisions have recently been approved down 69 South. Table three on the bottom of page one shows the list. There are 1,052 lots. Three large subdivisions are on the Bobby Miller Parkway. These are prime examples of fulfilling a need with the current housing shortage. Builders see the opportunity to contribute where housing is desperately needed. Another proven fact that it would be feasible to complete phase four of Hillcrest Gardens. In summary, <coughs> the shortage of all housing types has been demonstrated by Barclay Garrett's presentation. Demand is high, inventory is low. Homes are selling very quickly in our area. That the average number of days on the market is 55. Many new subdivisions are actively being built to satisfy the demand. Look at the list of approved subdivisions. Are these home builders going into their project blindly with little chance of success? No, quite the opposite. Let's take one more look at the definition of feasible, capable of being carried out. I hope by now you can see the complete, by, that by completing phase four of Hillcrest Gardens with gardens homes is highly feasible. The perfect recipe, fulfilling the economics of supply and demand while satisfying the dream of home ownership. There are many excellent home builders in the Tuscaloosa area. Hopefully one can be secured to complete phase four of Hillcrest Gardens. Please vote in opposition to amending the PUD rezoning to be in in the annexation. Thank you for your time. Just take the clock off. Mr. Chairman, next person to sign up looks like Anita Brennan. I'm Benita Brennan. I reside at 9288 Penrose Lane, Tuscaloosa, located in the Hillcrest Garden Subdivision. 
my comments to the commission regarding zoning annexation petitions P0309 to and AN0323. I have lived in Hillcrest Garden since 2002. After years of living in neighborhoods with no rules or regulations and seeing the results of no guidelines, I was ready for a neighborhood that had a restrictive covenant because I wanted a quieter, orderly environment for my retirement years. The time I purchased my home, it was marketed to me as being in phase three of a four-phase planned urban development. The home was marketed as having a restrictive covenant which provided for only residential homes to be built in phase four, which is an adjacent track of land less than four acres. Phase four would be the final installment of completing the developing development of the subdivision. Contrary to what Rob's investment states in their petition letter, I was never given prior notice to the possibility of the subdivision never being completed or I would not have purchased my home. In 2009, I received my first certified letter from Planning and Development regarding amending the master plan of Hillcrest Gardens Covenant and changing Phase 4 garden homes to 44 townhome units. Note that the land for Phase 4 is less than four acres. In 2017, the Planning and Zoning Committee had a meeting for a petition to rezone Hillcrest Gardens from R1 to BN, as well as annex it. In 2019, Rob's Investments caused a meeting of all homeowners regarding changing the zoning of Phase 4 to commercial, stating they want our input on construction in order to work together and get it right. The only thing that is going to make it right is going to be Phase 4 garden homes, just like the original HUD agreement states. The public shopping center was built in 2009. Along with it came a strip mall, the noise of large trucks unloading merchandise, huge security lights that are intrusive to nearby homeowners, increased traffic to surrounding streets, and higher crime risk. Neighbors whose property backed up to the strip mall can verify the detrimental effects it had to their property and how they finally had to seek legal action for resolution. 2023, once again, we are faced with zoning change recall. We have made our position very clear in 2009, 2017, 2019, and again today. We are not in favor of rezoning the land designated to phase four as commercial. Rob's Investments has had two meetings since December, January, and yet to disclose the proposed development. Rob says it's not feasible to carry out the master plan. I did some personal research by driving around and observing my neighborhood area. I arrived at several conclusions. One, there appears to be a consistent demand for more homes in this area as evidenced by numerous homes under construction in our area. There are three new subdivisions currently being constructed on the Bobby Miller Parkway and four more in Inglewood and surrounding areas. As for rezoning to commercial, I have personally observed postings for 10 different tracts of land in the immediate area with a commercial zoning already approved. I also toured strip mall centers in the immediate area and all but one had vacant spaces for rent. This is all within a two mile radius of Hillcrest Gardens. This leads me to draw the following conclusions. One, there is no shortage of commercial property or strip malls, many with vacancies. The demand for homes in this area is very strong. Homes for sale in Hillcrest Gardens are usually sold within 90 days or less. Some recent sales are sale off market, meaning by word of mouth. Apparently, people want to live here and they are willing to buy homes here if they are available. In closing, I respectfully request you to consider the facts as presented and deny the petitions for removal from the PUD, rezoning, and annexation. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, the next person looks like Barbara Allawine. Allawine? Thank you. I'm 
Barbara Aylwine. I live at 1073 <clears throat> Wisteria Drive in Hillcrest Gardens. I'm better known as Babs in the community. Uh, as I stated, I live at the very end of Wisteria Drive, right next to the property that's being discussed. When I uh, came back to live in Tuscaloosa, I wanted a quiet, safe, friendly, attractive, and clean neighborhood, <clears throat> which I found in Hillcrest Gardens. I live alone, a widow, but I feel safe in my neighborhood. I expect that when uh, the property next, I expected that when the property next to me was developed, that I would have good neighbors as I do have now. But not knowing what might be uh, within feet of not only my house, but my bedroom, <laughs> makes me nervous and fearful of what might be there. I'm, I'm old, and you can imagine being in my position. I'm not physically, mentally, nor financially able to move. Perhaps uh, you would be able to move away and someone might say, don't stay there if you don't like it. But for me, that's not an option. So how would you feel being in my position? To have a business or an apartment in such a close proximity to where you live and where you sleep. If your mother lived in my neighborhood, in the <coughs> house where I live, how would you feel about this proposal? Would you be, would you feel good about it, or would you be concerned about her safety and her comfort? Chair, the next person is Jack Robbins. Good evening. I'm Jack Robbins. I'm chairman of the grounds committee for Hillcrest Gardens, and I live at 1150 Perry Winkle Drive. Ms. Rumsey, I agree with your analysis. I think what we heard tonight is why nobody can build houses anywhere. But let's not rehash this data. Let's look at What's happening near Hillcrest Gardens? I'll give you one example. The Ledges development off Maxwell Loop Road has new single-story homes averaging 1,459 square feet, priced at an average $164 per square foot. This price includes the lot. It includes what the land costs and the site preparation costs, the construction costs, the overhead for the developer, and a profit. The total cost provided by Rob's is simply not realistic when compared to other developers. Also, in his analysis, he used the actual sales pricing of existing Hillcrest Garden homes from December 20 to July 2022. New homes typically carry a 20 to 35 percent premium over older existing homes. Analysis equating the sales price of new homes to the sales price of a 20-year-old home is simply not realistic. Finally, the infrastructure costs also look unrealistic. Building homes in phase four of our planned unit development would take advantage of a relatively flat land, of the ability to tie into existing sewer, water, gas, and electricity utilities also serving Hillcrest Gardens, and it, compared to these other costs up here where these folks are selling houses at greatly reduced price per square foot, his analysis is not realistic. Perhaps he's proven that Rob's is not the developer to put those houses in there, but he has not proved that it's not feasible to put houses in there. So for that reason, I would urge the Planning Commission not to approve the request to amend the existing plan unit development. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, the next person is William Pate. Thank you. First thing I would like to say is I, I do appreciate y'all's staff working with us and being willing to answer all our questions as, as best they could. And uh, uh, especially Zach, uh, I thought he did treat us well. Uh, 
these people are very scared that the houses that they built, lived in for their retirement are going to be reduced in value by this application tonight. They're scared to the point that they come out at night for meetings. Retired people don't usually bother. They are afraid to get out at night. But they've come to these meetings that Rob and Justin have. And let me, let me move it forward to what Rob Investment is. They're an LLC that's owned by a person that lives in New York State. Now, I think he's related to Dr. Prufy uh, because he has the same last name. But in any event, he lives, he, he signed the thing, the uh, information here uh, with a New York State notary. And a copy of that is uh, attached to uh, Mr. Parsons' letter. Mr. Parsons is our attorney. He's been with us here before with the last time the board turned us down. We're hoping you won't decide that the board's decision at that point was wrong. And we've also turned this down again. They have no plan, as far as I can tell. I think they just want to get it out of the pub and then try to sell it for whatever they can get out of it. And then that person will put whatever uh, they want to do uh, on there. Now, y'all have a list of all the possible possible things that can go on there, and I know you know that it includes filling stations, uh, motel, package liquor store, bistro, restaurant with attached bar, tire recapping plant, wine bar. Uh, is one of the those are the permitted permitted uses among permitted uses. Limited permitted uses include bar, tavern gastro pub, including live entertainment. So those things would, would really downgrade what is a nice community for a lot of older retired people who, who invested their life savings in this house and want to live there for the rest of their life. Now, we hired Mr. Parsons to research the situation with the termination. He did so, and he's provided a letter. I think he's given some important points here, and... Uh, I'd appreciate it if you would read that letter, but the most important point to me is the fact that the declarant is not Rob Investment. The declarant originally was Hillcrest Gardens, LLC. They divested all their interest in the property, and it's our understanding is that the right to vacate or eliminate the PUD would have ended when they did not have a, an interest in the property Okay, Rob Investment is not a successor entity to LLC Gardens, uh, and he's cited some cases in there as well as some uh, dicta from Alabama courts that, that say that that right to do to terminate the PUD should have been eliminated once the original person owning that right divested their economic interest. Now, I know you're aware that the HUD has, has been there for a long time. It's been there since 1996. They've had 26 years. I think the economy has gone up and down during those times. Prices of homes, prices of wood has gone up and down. New building materials are available. I don't doubt that prices right now are high. Of course, that's, that's when they decide to strike, strike us down this time. And they're trying to use the idea that they can't build houses there. There, there seem to be hundreds of houses going on in the, up in this neighborhood. They're all around there. Uh, the, the TCRIC is building a new bridge over Skyland Boulevard to move more cars in that direction, and growth is going down there. They want to sell this for what they can get out of it. They're not willing to tell us what's going there, but it's a, it, it could be a lot of different things, and it could seriously disrupt this neighborhood. We ask you to deny this request because of all the things that we've cited here. It's not impossible to build there. And, and finally, the, the zoning, this will, we will be opposed to that and would ask that our comments and, and the papers we've furnished be included in those two files as well. Are there any further questions at this point? Mr. Chairman, we had one other person sign up. Can I can I clarify something real quick? Surely, a tire recapping plant, from what I see, is not within BN designation. Sorry, it, can you repeat that? It's not. <laughs> Thank you. 
So you cannot have it. I mean, there are uh, you, most of the things you listed are accurate, but that one sounded way out of bounds to me. What did you ask, Ann? There is no tire recapping plant under BNs. They, uh, that one startled me. So I had to look and make sure that these folks weren't risking that. Um, but the others look the others look accurate. But uh, from what I see under the ordinances, that's I don't, not. I don't accurate. know. I don't know who to direct this question to, but. Did I read in this letter that this this property has been a been part of a foreclosure? At one time, yeah. So, so the original developers made a lot of promises. Is that is that reasonable to say? In other words, they they talked about this being houses, and then were the original developers foreclosed on? They I guess they had a loan and they were foreclosed on, and the bank sold this property to somebody else. Yes, sir. The bank bought the property in and then sold it. So, so, and I don't know who any of these parties are. Okay, so. You know, but it looks to me like, you know, with all due respect to the attorney that was here earlier, you know, you look at maps and you see land along major right-of-ways like 69 South, and you go, common sense says this will be a business or whatever. I guess, but, but, but we also have a moral obligation to look at the context of what was promised when the development was put in to begin with. I'm trying to understand, it looks to me like, and I, won't, I guess maybe Jimbo can clarify, Looks to me like they promised this was going to be 102, 102 houses, and um, they didn't. Did they mention a caveat to allow to allow commercial in their original PUD, Jimbo, or or whomever I should address that question to? Because if they didn't, it doesn't seem like there's a, an obligation to annex or rezone a parcel, if, even if it is on a 69 South. Yeah. So the original PUD's master plan showed those being houses. So, and then those developers let it be foreclosed on. The bank took it and sold it to somebody else that had to be aware of the obligations that were promised. Is that reasonable? That's right. It, the land would still be under the PUD, and that's why. Yeah, it would still be bound by the same restrictions, yeah. but that's what they're trying to use the, the escape clause from that. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, we've got, I understand it. we've got one other person that signed up. Can we close public comment? Okay, sorry. Hannah Lori Delbridge, the bridge. The bridge. Okay, you don't want to speak. Okay, all right. I, I, I want to make this point to make, and if, if I might have permission to two sentences. Pardon me? Sure. One last point I wanted to make, if I could have permission to speak a couple of sentences. At one of the meetings that I attended, the representative of the, the Rob Investment asked us, well, what would you do if we just came in and cut down all those trees there? You couldn't do anything. We could just bring it in and all those trees would be gone. I felt like they were trying to intimidate us and get us to agree to let them go even though even they knew they shouldn't do this and they don't have to it. They also said we should not have bought in this hood with a provision that allowed the declarant to vacate the PUD, to terminate the PUD. And this representative said that he would never buy anything in the PUD. And I think that also was made to intimidate these older people who were sitting there. And we're trying to say that we're in favor of you doing what you told us you were going to do. We're in favor of you building houses that meet the requirements. And we will work with you for that. And I believe they can do that as well as they could do anything else, any commercial thing. There are houses going up all around. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. I request it. Anyone, well, that's all who signed up to speak. Is there anyone else who would care to speak for or against this petition before we bring back a petitioner to uh, answer some of the items that arose? care to speak, please come forward and state your name and address for the record, please. Hi, I'm Grace Gilchrist. I live at 1130 Wisteria Drive. And as Ms. Alwyn said, it is very comforting and very, a very secure feeling 
to live in our neighborhood when you're, when you're very mature. And uh, we know everybody, or we know who, who everybody is. And when we see them walking around, we, we know, you know, it's, it's our neighbors and we feel safe. And it's, it's very comforting. And, and I just wanted to say that. I also wanted to say that I am so against anything else commercial out there on our, near our property. Because we have already everything out there that we need. We've got restaurants and banks and doctors and grocery stores and the vet and, and a place to do gyms and swim and schools. Whatever. We don't need any, anything else commercial in our area. And I ask you all please to consider that we don't need any of that. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else? Okay. We allow the petitioner to come back up and address any uh, concerns he heard and wants to address. If he brings up any information, we'll be allowed to respond. So, Mr. Yes, sir. Winter. Um, can I put my thing up there? Okay. Um, first thing is, with respect to what was told in the notice, I don't know about that. I wasn't there. But I do know that on 10-31-96, the covenants were filed with the court, which becomes part of the official record, public notice, that the rest of the subdivision need not be built. If it was, you know, we go back to that covenant, if it was economically, you know, not possible. Um, and there's more to that covenant, just so, you know, it's not just impossible, and now this doesn't want to work on me. Um, but if we look at that covenant, there we go. Excuse me for one sec. I want you to see the cover. Yeah, we'll get it. We'll get it. What's that? Did I what passed it? Yeah, what are you trying to show? I'm trying to show that covenant. That was hold, in on, your hold on, hold on. Okay, I won't click. There we go. Thank you so much. <coughs> so it doesn't just say impossible. It says unprofitable to the declarants or unreasonable. Okay? Now, I've shown you tonight that, in fact, you can't make a profit at the cost of prices on here, okay? It doesn't have to be impossible. There's always possibilities. Everything's possible. It just has to be unprofitable or unreasonable. And I think it's unreasonable to force somebody to say they have to build something that can't be economically done. That's the issue. Now, as to what was told or what wasn't told, I don't know. But I did know, and one thing I did know is that if it's in writing with respect to property, that is the rule. You follow the writing. So these, these covenants that stated this were filed on 103196, 8-16-01, 10-3-01, 8-12-04, and 6-3-05. Nothing else has been built out there ever since. If I may. Yes, sir. You're saying we need to follow the written rule. Well, we need I, to follow the written, we need to follow the writing. No, I, I'm not saying you have to follow anything. I'm not yeah. directing you. What I'm saying to you is the fact that there was no notice that they need not build this, I don't think is accurate. Well, now, I'm maybe sorry. nobody told them in person, but when you buy a house with an HOA and covenants, it's incumbent upon you to read the covenant. So when you, so when you have that right, and yes, sir. you're making a promise, and they promise that they, they have an out. Right. They also sign a note with the bank, and they didn't live up to it. They didn't pay. Right. So it got foreclosed on, mm -hmm. and someone else bought it. That's right. Someone perhaps without those rights. Is that reasonable? But the person, no, it's not reasonable, actually, I don't believe. And the reason why is because the covenants of the homeowners didn't get foreclosed on, and those covenants still apply to those homeowners. So those homeowners knew from the day they bought it that you need not build the four sections. So the people that wrote the HOA documents, mm -hmm didn't pay their debt as they, they signed their name to an agreement and didn't pay. Is that, is that reasonable in a foreclosure? I'm just saying, I, my point I just want to make sure the foreclosure thing was right because okay. I, you know, I can't keep it all. I mean, usually time. when things are foreclosed on, it's for non-payment. I've never. That's right. That's right. No, I don't doubt it was. I just want to make sure it was actually foreclosed upon. 
Um, so I, what I'm saying, Mr. What I'm saying, Mr. Rumsey, is that everybody got up here and said, "Oh, they didn't tell us this. They didn't tell us this." You can't just say you got to live up to all the written requirements and then say, "Well, this guy signed a bank note and he didn't. He didn't live up to his requirements." That's not these people. Okay. So let me let me make a couple of points. First of all, I want to thank everybody for being so eloquent. Uh, I don't think I've ever been to a to a meeting where people spoke so well and eloquently and made their points. I need to take a lesson from them. The um, but I did want to point out, could you go to that blank part, that, go to that second half? Um, okay, so this is, this is the second half. And when we were at our last meeting, uh, some of the residents brought up the fact, well, if it's, not, if it's not possible, and again, that's the word possible, the question is, is it profitable or reasonable? If it's not possible to build, why are all these other subdivisions going up? And the one they mentioned were up on Old Greensboro Road, which is being excavated right now. Haven Ridge, Village of Pinecrest, Tartan, the Ledges, and Ridge Haven South. Now let me take two and deal with two of them. First of all, Stonebrook, which is a Harless product, Har Jeff Harless is developing that, is actually going to be duplexes, triplexes, and quadplexes, if I'm correct. So that's really not single-family homes. I don't think it's an act, an act, I don't think it's a reasonable comparison for what they want us to do, which is build single-family homes. Ridge Haven South was originally came up for a uh, hearing and then was withdrawn uh, back last summer. So we really have Haven Ridge, the village of Pinecrest, Tartan, and the Ledges. Now let me go through these with you. Again, I said Stonebridge is a multiplex. Haven Ridge has 179 lots, and the lots are the lots, the typical lot size is 70 by 135, and it's 10,000 square foot a lot, which is double the size of what is in um, uh, Hillcrest Gardens. Now look where. I want you to note here where Haven Ridge and Pinecrest and Tartan are. Those basically about Bobby Miller Parkway and the Bobby Miller Recreational Center. They're not built up against Highway 69. Okay, that's a much better, you know, property location, location, location. If I could live in those sec those areas there and my kids could walk to the Bobby Miller Center every day and the park and the playgrounds and all that, yeah, I have paid a little more for that. And yeah, I might be able to build some houses over there for that. But if I live over here and my kids got to cross 69, it's a little different, okay? That's the first thing. If you look at the village of Pinecrest, that's the most likely of it. But again, that has 92 lots. So when they do their infrastructure there, they're dividing that infrastructure by 92 lots, not 16 or 19, okay? There's a cost efficiency because you're spreading that out over different things. Now Tartan Cove is another huge development and it's 204 lots. Again, that's, those are 50% bigger than the lots in Hillcrest Gardens, but look at the size of that. That's a massive development. And that massive development is, is literally, oh, excuse me, ah, nuts. Where'd we go here, guys? Sorry. Oh, uh, yeah. Hold back on. Yep. Sorry. I apologize. Okay. That, if you see Tartan Cove in there, it's in the purple. That is a massive subdivision. Now let's talk about the ledges. Okay, the ledges is also going to be a significant subdivision with 151 homes. And that's being built by an outfit out of Arkansas called Roush Coleman. They're very much like a D.B. Horton. They're a super regional, basically half national firm. And those, those lots that they're building there are twice as big, but I'll show you how it's interesting, Roush Coleman, how they advertise their homes. They're looking for a certain set of customers. They advertise their homes by, here's your monthly payment. And the number that, I think it was Mr. Tate or somebody quoted, on their website it says, starting at. Well, yeah, that's the base model, where they don't have things that we usually put in garden homes in Tuscaloosa County. But if they're selling, you know, you walk in to buy a car, they say, hey, what kind of payment do you need, right? That's what everybody asks. I don't want a payment. I don't know the price. I want to know the discount off the sticker price. This company is selling the homes to folks based upon what their payment is. And then they go get the financing. They also do the financing, which means they flip the paper. In other words, they're probably making as much off the financing, as far as I know, as they are off the property. That's a different type of development. It's going to attract different people. It's not going to be retirees. It's going to be people who are looking for a certain price at a certain rate. Okay, so let's talk about, these are just two that give you an example. 
Here's the first section of Haven Ridge right here, okay? Now, if you look at the prices here, it's $451,220. Now, this is also a big outfit, maybe not as big as D.B. Horton or, or, um, uh, or Roush Coleman, but it's still a big outfit. So they're doing a, a significant size house, 2,500 square feet, 2,400 square feet, 2,400 square feet. These that one house up there actually had a three-car garage in it. So it's a completely different size lot, completely different size house. And as we said before, when you get to bigger houses, the price goes down per square foot. The average price here is 173. That's the starting average price. But when you go in and put the extras in and things you might want or might have in your house, that's gonna go up and that average price is gonna go up. Again, that average price is for a house that's tubbled, you know, a thousand square feet more, and that's an economy of scale. Let's talk about the ledges. Um, because actually, Roush Coleman has three properties. Some of you may remember Cherokee Bend, that's right outside Moundville. I think that's had more owners than I have hired socks that, socks that don't fit. Um, but for example, Smithfield Gardens, this is how they advertise it, starting at $14.85 per month. The ledges started at $12.99 principal and interest per month. Well, that's how you advertise it. Then you go in and you fit whatever payment plan you can get for that. You're not selling it by the, the, the <laughs> they're, not, they're not marketing this as the price of the home. They're marketing it to sell it like a car or a motorhome or a boat. Okay, so it's a different kind of subdivision. And to the extent their prices are lower, it's because they're marketing to a different level of people and those houses, I would submit to you, may not have the, the, the charm and the quality that are in Hillcrest Gardens. So there's three main points here. Number one is there was notices and all the covenants that all these folks got. These other subdivisions, when they mentioned these to me, I went out and scattered them out and looked at them too, and we spent a lot of time looking at them, okay? Um, you know, and so... There's, there's literally a difference between what you're going to get in these other subdivisions that are building and the subdivision of Hillcrest Garden. Now, the last thing that's important to know about that, they've, they've platted these, preliminary plat, and they may start building homes. We don't know how many will actually sell. The other thing you have to realize with builders right now is that a lot of builders have gone out last year when the money was cheap and they might have bought a huge piece of property at 25 or 3% variable rate interest. Now, Mr. Rumsey, you're, you've done a lot of building. They may have 50 acres. They may have this piece of property. But now, instead of having 3 million or 4 million or 5 million at three, two and a half, three percent floating, now they're looking at six, seven, or eight. That's a huge chunk of money every, every month they're laying out. So what's their best option? Their best option is to get something up, sell it, sell it, sell it, even if it's cheap because they want to get out of the bank on the land. So when you're talking about a nationwide builder, there's a whole lot of different economies of scale there. They have greater buying power than most people have here, and they also have perhaps different needs and reasons why they're building. It might sell the house below market rate to get out of the bank with the land. So I, I come back to the simple fact is we've got two very respected builders in Tuscaloosa County that says it's going to cost $165 a square foot to build garden homes like those in Hillcrest Garden. Homes like the folks here want to have the neighbors, and that's not possible. So everybody who bought a home there, and I, I, my heart, I feel, I feel it. I know their passion. We all care about our homes. But the reality is, is that everybody had noticed that the last section need not be built and that this is financially not capable of doing it to build the homes there. Maybe if there were 150 lots, maybe if there were 300 lots, maybe if there were 90 lots. But this is 19 lots with a million dollars worth of infrastructure. So I appreciate all the heartfelt strings here. But the reality is I think we meet the covenants, and I think it's time to let's make this property be the best use. Nothing's been built there since 2005, and prices aren't going down anytime soon. Thank you so much. I'd be happy to answer. What, what, year, did the, what, did, what year did the developer purchase the property? It was before 1996. I don't know the answer. No, I'm talking about the, the owner now. The owner now? Who, what who, year did you get the property? And by the way, just so you know, Dr. Pruthie's son, is the owner of Rob's Investments. It's Rob Pruthie. So okay. What year did he buy the property? What year did he buy it? 2014 or 13. 2014 or 13. Okay. Um, and just so you know, Dr. Pruthie, uh, he, he's a veterinarian in town for a long time. Nice man. And that's his beautiful wife. Much more beautiful. Dr. Pruthie's like me. He got a woman that he shouldn't have been able to get to marry. 
Um, must have been an arranged marriage for you, Doc. Anyway, uh, and she runs the wonderful Indian restaurant. So if you haven't gone there, go try it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Commissioner, I don't believe any, any new information was brought to our attention that the those in opposition would have any, I guess, issue with. Uh, we could probably be here for quite some time on the, on the very emotional issue here. But that being said, I think we're probably at a point we need to close and discuss amongst ourselves. You know, I'm not a lawyer, but it's very conflicting to me. You've got a, a covenant that's got a phase four, but you also have a covenant that allows for hardship economic to withdraw the uh, future development. So that, again, not being an attorney, I, it's, I struggle with this. I understand the, the, the neighbors, and they're, they've obviously got a great neighborhood. I mean, you can tell by the, the types of tenants we've spoken tonight. They care about the neighborhood. They care about each other. On the other hand, you also got a, a, a property owner that has some rights as well. And he's sitting here going, well, I can't, I can't afford to build 16 or 19 houses. What's the best use of, of my property? So it really is a challenging situation, and I, I, again, it's probably there's not a, a real winner in this whole case, but um, that's where I'm conflicted and trying to make a determination on. So those are my comments. Jimbo, let me ask you a question. One of the, one of the comments was brought up about that they did proceed into building phase four in the PUD. They built one lot into the phase four. Does that not, does that not constitute the development of phase four by building at least one lot into it? Well, they certainly started phase four. And now they're just saying they want to remove the rest of that property from the PUD and not complete phase four. And back back to my original conversation with you at the start of this two hours ago. Did This is discretionary. This is discretionary on this body's part, whether it is economically in, not feasible, correct? Correct. The restrictive covenants would certainly be a hurdle if they were coming in and they hadn't gotten that done yet. Um, but the restrictive covenant would just be saying that they would not have to complete it. It doesn't say that they would then be able to go forward, remove the property, and do anything different with it as PM. So it's really, the restrictive covenant's really not an issue for you. It's just whether they've come forward and they've given you good grounds as to why they should have the property removed from the PUD. You might have researched this, and I've just barely skimmed the letter from uh, Mr. Parsons. But, you know, every, th these have been re recorded, the restrictive covenants, and added signatories. And those signatories are defined as declarants in the document. It says the undersigned declarants. Does that have any bearing? on whether or not those signatories should have also entered into whatever was filed to try to take this particular restrictive covenant I, I haven't out. looked at it at all, so I can't say whether what they've recorded could be challenged or not. And, and I guess, Dana, my question to the legal minds here, regardless of what we do, if that there there could be civil matters related to that based on what y'all have discussed. Is that correct? Okay. I mean, is that well the other thing too that gives me heartburn and I you know, I mean, this PUD was developed you know, platted or the, the master plan was approved in nineteen ninety six. And so they've had from that time forward to have developed it. During times that were more economically feasible and for whatever reason it wasn't it wasn't done so it you know is it economically feasible right now I have no idea I mean I'm just I'm not you know I can't make that determination I know we've got to at some point but but I can say I think they've had ample enough time to develop it as it was planned I mean, otherwise, why do we have a PUD? So that, that gives me heartburn. And, and hey, listen, I mean, let, we, you know, yes, everybody should read a restrictive covenant that's put on record at the county courthouse. Do people do that? No. I mean, they don't. I mean, 
it's to satisfy a legal requirement, but I mean, I'm an attorney and I don't even know if my subdivision has restricted covenants. It's so old, they didn't have them in the 20s probably, but I wouldn't have read them before I bought my house. Well, if you look at if you look at the property that's north, you have what looks like a, I don't know, maybe it's, a, I don't know if that's a doctor's office or a bank or, you know, but 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 they're, they're displaying almost worst case scenario with this big box. And that's the most frightening thing. And I realize that they can show a big box and they may end up doing things like this. But, you know, it doesn't look like it's necessarily about right. I realize y'all are talking about this is a, a legal issue that, may end up being decided elsewhere. But it seems like to me the people that entered into this and made these promises, to your point, not the same people. They may not be the people that have the right to declare this not feasible. And, you know, I'm just using common sense. He, he says it's going to cost a million dollars. I don't know why why you couldn't put a house here and a house here and a house here, you know, and tie onto the sewer line that's there. Why, why, why can't you do that? I mean, you know, if... Land Glide says the land cost $75,000, so whoever bought it must have bought it at a price that, that was discounted quite a bit for fear that it couldn't be developed. I mean, I'm just going by what technology says. I mean, so if it was if this was $75,000, then then a lot is probably worth fifty to $75,000. It's like you could build houses on each side of the street and pick up a quarter of a million dollars for lots. I mean, I, that's just, am I missing something? I mean, I don't know why it cost a million dollars to run sewer lines to those houses. But TTL, I guess, did, did the numbers. But if it did, did cost a million dollars, it's going to cost a million dollars to run it to the commercial. <laughs> but, but even still, I heard what Brian said about, and, and he always amazes me because he makes a very compelling argument. He always does. He's very, he is as good as they, you can good as there is, um, but I just, I, I see the highway and I hear what he's saying, but I'm still not convinced that the promises made by the original developers shouldn't be upheld somewhat by this board. Maybe I need to be convinced that, that those weren't promises made. Because we do know that they'll now break the their work. We do know that they'll break. Before, before 1996. But we also know that the, we also know that the same developers. Let's just say that the, the covenants that allow them to break this rule. We also know that they, that they broke their, their their deal with the bank. Now that goes somewhere with me. I'm kind of old school. If I sign my name, I'm gonna pay if I can. I mean, but what does that have to do with the covenant? I'm saying that, 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 that we're, we're being told we need to live by the written rule, and that written rule says if you borrow, if you borrow $10, I'm going to pay you back $10. I mean, they didn't live by it because it was foreclosed on. Well, that doesn't the, the, the buyer, though, he yeah. bought the covenants yeah. as well. Yeah. The, the covenants didn't change. Right. That's, yeah. the, that's, that's, the, that's the counter that's, to that is like right. it's there. It's and it's, different folks. I mean, it's, it's. And that's not this owner. So, 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 yeah. the, right. so this. This developer came in front of us in 2017. If they bought it in 2013, then they've been in front of us the last two times before. On what grounds did we turn them down? I don't have any idea. I can't remember. Does anybody know? Because <laughs> we obviously had the same situation, right? I don't, I don't know that. I was here, but I don't remember. <laughs> I, 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 well, I'm, one time I'm, it was, it was uh, a lot of units. It was yeah. still going to be residential, right. right? But it was oh, like it was be 44 units. Yeah. Yeah. 44 yeah. lots. That 44. Yeah. That's what. Yeah. 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 I mean, I don't know that anybody's brought a compelling argument to us prior to this that there was an economic, it wasn't economically feasible and that that, that was brought out. I don't remember that. That's an issue, no? I, I, I guess um, I, I don't know how you could force the developer to build houses. I mean, uh, they just won't happen um, if they've said it's not profitable. So I'm stuck with that too, right? I mean. Oh, and I'm not saying that either. I'm not saying that. But well, I, that's the alternative, right? Is well, it, no, no, no. I would they'd, say, have to buy, they'd have to well, build houses. Well, there are several different zonings that you can bring. I mean, you bring it in under one, but you can, I mean, to me, I'm just saying look at what's north. They're not big boxes. They don't, you know, 
they're they're more they, they, they appear to be perhaps more neighborhood friendly. Right. But but Mr. Winter says, well, we can't even go make a deal with a neighborhood friendly uh, veterinarian if we can't get it zoned and annexed. So I understand that part. But uh, but that goes back to neighborhood friendly development. I'm not so sure that what looks like the Amazon uh, you know the Amazon office building is is. is <laughs> well, maybe it would be. I understand. I understand that, too. I, 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 I would say uh, one question that came up was about whether there was access off 69 to the neighborhood. And it, it doesn't appear that there's any access from 69 to the neighborhood. Right? I mean, that's so that is, that is that's being honored um, still, that there's no... There's no access from 69 to your neighborhood. Sir, we, we've, we've closed to... We've closed this... We, we've closed discussion. There's, we're talking amongst ourselves. I mean that's that's clear from the from the drawing that there would not be access to the neighborhood. We close discussion. Any other comments from commissioners? I mean we're conservation easement. Conservation easement. Conservation easement. Mr. Ramsey, I could see when you come in <laughs> through the neighborhood where you could use about half of this lot to build houses, but. When you go up and down 69 South, there's a Jacks. You look next door to this. Is a, I think that's a dock in a box and a taco casa or something. And new neighborhoods aren't built on major highways. So I could see half of this lot being in the neighborhood, but the other half is going to be wasted. Yeah. And it looks like they knew it when they did it. Well, I don't know about that. It was done... 1996 or something. Hey, why, why wouldn't they have extended the sewer line from the very beginning? I mean, what, it looks like they, it was like this play was being held in their back pocket. You, the developer, you, the smart one, you, would you have done it this way? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm saying, well, I'm saying, I may have left it for commercial development, but I doggone sure told them this could be commercial development. Fair point. Kind of says that in the in the covenant. It says in the it future could be, if it's not. Financially, uh, well, you know what you know what that is. That's lawyer speak, Eddie. That's that's attorney speak. Hey, <laughs> Jimbo and I take offense. <laughs> that's what that's what you call, speak That's called a lawyer giving you a squiggly <laughs> way out in the future. Yeah, a lawyer got with a developer and came up with that language. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other comments? We ultimately got to make a decision here, folks. Uh, real quickly. So, I would like to know, Mr. Ponds, can you remind us what would be allowed in the BN zoning? Some examples we've got include a restaurant. Um, here is the full yeah. list for you all to read. Retail office, as Ms. Hornby mentioned, tire, recap tire recapping plant is not allowed. Uh, this could be a grocery or drugstore. A photography studio, some kind of professional okay. office. We're good. Any other questions for staff or comments? Okay, Commission, we have a couple of votes to take here. The just for the record, um, let me check something here real quick on the. We're going to take three separate votes. There will be the the PUD annexation and the rezoning. Um, if the PUD is approved, it will be conditional upon the annexation and the rezoning. Now, all those will go in front of the city council. They'll have the final authority on on those decisions. So once public to be aware of that so this is not the if this thing passes as is there will be one more opportunity to address your concerns at the city council level just want to make that for the record commission before us we have pud request 0309 hillcrest gardens to amend the existing planning and development remove the two lots from the existing Hillcrest Garden subdivision. Do we have a motion and a second? Motion to approve. Second. Ms. Hornsby. Yes. 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 Mr. Ramsey. 
I'm trying to understand what I'm doing. Explain that again, Mr. You're, Chairman. We're voting to remove the two lots from the existing HOA or the existing subdivision of Hillcrest Gardens. So yes would be you approve to remove. No. Yes. No. Yes. 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 Commission, before us, we have annexation 0323, annexing 3.7 acres into the city of Tuscaloosa. Do I have a motion and a second? Motion. Second. Mr. Ramsey. Yes. I mean, I'm saying they want to bring it in Tuscaloosa, bring it. Yeah. Ms. Hare? Okay, so the first one is with removing the two lots. They still have the option to develop the two lots. Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. right. I don't think they give up any rights. They're just not in the county but, anymore. They're in the city, right? We made, right? we made the first one conditional on the approval of these two. But, I mean, it's... In other words, to me, an annexation is just, you're either in the city or you're not. Correct. Yeah. I don't care whether they want to be in the city, they can be. Yes. 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 Motion approved. Commission before us, we have Z0323. Since they have been annexed into the city, they're automatic commence R1. They're requesting to be rezoned to BN. Motion to approve. Second. Ms. Hornsby. Yes. 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 No. 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 Yes. No. Yes. I think it's 5 4. I think it's 4 That's right. So those will go to the City Council with an affirmative recommendation. City Council will now take up this matter. Right? I thought that was, I thought it was four. Oh, you got the number. Jimbo, get your get your count again. Five, five four. Get your count again on yeses versus noes. I, I, I heard I heard different. Okay. Well, let's just revote because I couldn't understand. <coughs> Someone okay. just sounded like just a sound. It was very difficult to <laughs> distinguish between is that a yes or a no. Okay. okay. You're going really fast. So okay. Let's just revote. Yes. Right. yes. 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 No. 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 Yes. No. Yes. <laughs> Five four. Those will go to the city council. That is a perfect, that is a perfect observation. Mm. I don't. Somebody. How you doing? I think it's hot to you walk in. Yeah. If you're you staying in the yeah. auditorium, please stay. If you're going to leave, please depart. We can continue. We'll have this well. I think we can. They're pretty quiet leaving the. I think the commission needs to participate. All right, commission. Moving into companion case B for the evening. It consists of a subdivision and annexation. We'll begin with that subdivision. We have SO223. This is Emerald's Edge. It's consisting of 197 residential lots and eight open space lots. 
on approximately 419 acres, and it's located north and west of Lewis Spur, and it's bordering Lake Tuscaloosa. This is currently not in city limits. Here is a vicinity map. Uh, we are up and around the lake, right across from the existing Legacy Point subdivision, uh, running along Sexton Bend Road. Here is an aerial view of the property tonight. And here is that plat with contours and without. Again, this is 197 residential lots. They do have an annexation request tied to this. So they are platting these lots to go and conform with R1 standards. They will do this in three phases. In the pink will be phase one. They are constructing all of the roads that you see here are proposed right of way. Uh, these will be public streets. All lots are facing the public streets. Going up in the development in blue, I believe that is their phase two, and yellow will be phase three. Each lot, I believe the average is about two acres, and they are, uh, I believe it's half a dwelling unit per acre for their density. They are requesting partial sidewalk construction along Sexton Bend Road. They are requesting the maximum cul-de-sac width, width like, sorry, the maximum cul-de-sac cul -de -sac length, that is really hard to say apparently, <laughs> and they are also requesting ribbon curb in lieu of current curb and gutter and capped sewer. And then I'll let you all look at that plat one last time. I know that was kind of a lot, but it 197 lots. Engineering only, variance request. We're in agreement with those variance requests. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, jumping into the annexation, we have annexation 123, and this is to annex approximately 394 acres of the 419 that you previously just saw. I'll point out the specific lots that they are not requesting to annex. Again, vicinity map, aerial image. Shaded in green will be the lots that they're requesting to annex. Zooming in towards where the beginning of the development is, lots one and two they would like to leave in city limits. Uh, framework does call this area future service and expansion area. Here's that future land use map showing lakeside living as well as rural edge and, con and conservation development. And this is due to, the annexation is due to uh, tying into city schools. As always, eight points of evaluation criteria were outlined. And speaking with other city departments, Office of the City Engineer had no issues, as well as the City Attorney's Office, and Environmental Services stated that services will not be provided. The petitioner has prepared a presentation for you all this evening. Do you have questions for staff? Let it go back to the map. said the two lots are from between those locations of five and eight. They do not need to be named. That's right. Okay. Yep, so the oh, lots shaded in red, the uh, they are not. Right, yeah, sorry. So those two lots in red will remain in the county, and then all that are shaded green, they're requesting to bring into city limits. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay, we'll have the petitioner come with their presentation. Petitioner. I'm almost embarrassed to say that we brought a PowerPoint presentation, but we don't have 80 <laughs> slides, so we'll make it we'll make it quick. I'm Jimmy Duncan with Duncan Coker Associates uh, here tonight, representing Lake Island Estates LLC, uh, Graham McCabe, Derek Rice, Trip Rogers, AJ Tosciali, and Corey White, three members of that LLC. Uh, everyone but AJ could make it tonight um, to help with any questions that may come up. Uh, the project architect is Ward Scott Morris Architecture. That's helped with some of the renderings you're going to see momentarily. So Hallie's covered most of this, but uh, property acreage overall, touch over 400 acres, uh, three phases with a total yield of just under 200 lots with about 100 in phase one, 30 in phase two, and 70 in phase three. Um, the density is something we want to key on with this. The, these five gentlemen um, have listened to every recommendation we made along the way about this project. The first and foremost being density. When we first sat down and started talking about, you know, what do we want this, what do we, the vibe that we want to set with this thing, I'm not mass grading it, and the density is half of what we could have yielded with this thing. Half of the lots per acre. Um, City of Tuscaloosa water, obviously. Uh, On-site sewer disposal, this is well within reach of city uh, sewer services. Uh, so we're going to go with on-site sewer disposal. 
obviously the annexation component. Um, some criteria about the, the house, um, the houses and garages, architectural controls. This project will have very strict architectural uh, controls, houses, mailboxes, you name it. Uh, three styles of lots within this project, the cottage lots, which are generally going to be lot 16 through 33. I remind you these are cottages on one acre lots, so it's not going to be, just close your eyes when you think, when you're trying to think of cottages. This will be a house on a one acre lot. Um, we've used this one cul-de-sac in phase one as these cottages so that they've got most direct access to the clubhouse and the shared boat slip. Uh, moving up one notch, the interior lots, those of which are not lakefront but not cottages, 3,000 square foot minimum. Uh, up to the lakefront products, which are 3,500 square feet. Um, all garages will be two-car minimum, no street-facing uh, garages. Again, strict architectural control. And along with numerous up utility upgrades that this project is going to trigger, uh, C Spire is committed to bring high-speed internet to this area, which is a, a, a lengthy uh, extension from the south uh, that would uh, allow the rest of the vicinity to pile on to um, in the future for high-speed internet. Some of the common area elements uh, most of these renderings that you're going to see, War Scott Morris has prepared. We have one, um, a sample, if you will, at the end that's going to speak to kind of the, the look and the feel of the way we want the entrance uh, to look. But this is the south-facing view, the front view of the clubhouse and the pool, which is going to be on common area E in phase one, which is the central cul-de-sac in phase one. Uh, it's on a slough. It's not on the main body of the lake. Uh, this is a rear back uh, look of the pool, uh, looking from the southwest uh, to the northeast. Um, very nice architectural product and another view uh, of the pool. Also at the clubhouse element, you'll notice uh, two more tiered um, exercise play areas, the first being a playground, which is one tier down from the pool, and then nearest the lake, um, a basketball court, batting cages, and pickleball courts. Lastly, on that common area, lot E, uh, some community boat slips. I will say that we have not talked to the Lakes Division about this in terms of the dock geometry, the length of the docks, the number of the slips, anything like that. But that's something we'll address down the road. This is just giving the feel of how, how the flow that we want uh, going down to the water, preserving everything between uh, the basketball courts and the, the boat slips. This is just the basis of the design of the entrance, we're going to be making an application for a right-of-way use permit um, for a nice, um, instead of the arches, there's going to be a kind of a, a square architectural element with this with this entry. Uh, we looked at originally at gates. That was unfortunately going to put us over in the plan unit development category, which we quickly got away from. We're going to pursue something along these lines. Um, water quality control measures. I know this is something that's, that's near and dear to everybody's heart. Um, again, something that we put an extreme focus on with this project with Mike's department, uh, being sure that we've got everything when we get to the construction plan and the official design uh, stage of this project that everybody knows where we're going. So four main points. Uh, we're not mass grading this entire development. Um, while the, the, yacht, the lot yield would be um, massive, hundreds and hundreds, if not getting into the thousands of lots with a mass grading operation, we're preserving the natural drainage patterns and basically the topography of the roads is matching the roads that are already there with limited grading. Um, along with that, rib ribbon curb, with the exception of the entrance road, which will have guttered curb segments, boulevards, et cetera. We've got to have guttered uh, curb, guttered segments along through there. Um, but the ribbon curb is an important, an important component that's been used uh, with success on lakefront developments in, in the past. Uh, limited concentrated discharges, again, that speaks to the ribbon curbs with, without collecting the water in a curb section, we're allowed to release it in a non-concentrated manner off, off of right away. And then streamside buffer zones is something that's not new, it's the city's ordinances and standards speak to it, but we're going to take it to a, a more uh, specific required level with this project. Again, the ribbon curb, everybody knows uh, what that looks like. The streamside buffer zones, everything you see in green, so this is phase one um, for the most part. Everything you see in green is conceptually what we intend to preserve and designate as a streamside buffer zone. Um, the reasons that are obviously where we do not have that green hatch on those streams is where we're crossing them with our roads, and then the areas that flank the roads where we're going to have some significant grading to get the roads over these streams. Um, six different segments on this on this view, 
uh, four more on the on the northern section, uh, which creates thousands of feet of streamside uh, buffers that we're going to create for this project. Those buffers are going to be platted, so it's not just some idea that we're going to hope is memorialized down the road when all of us are gone. It will be on the plat and in the cover. So here's a, a section of the way that's going to look. All of these streams, of course, are going to have a, a drainage easement component to them. In most cases, we see that being a 30-foot section. Drainage easement, obviously, we've got pass-through water. We've got to deal with that in an easement scenario. Beyond that, uh, 25 feet from the center of the stream, which the centers of these streams, if, if we need to go back to the master plan, you can see it. Um, those stream centers pretty much coincide with rear, rear, rear setback, rear lot lines, excuse me. Um, and so 25 feet either side of those rear lot lines to the center of the streams will be this buffer zone. Um, faintly in, in there, you can see on our little cartoon uh, the trees that we intend to preserve. So in those buffer zones, again, 50 feet wide, no tree removal or grading without authorization from the Architectural Review Committee. Um, and obviously there may be some circumstances that are extreme whereby a tree may need to be cut down something's fallen that's blocking the drainage that has to be removed there will be scenarios where that'll have to be dealt with but given the topography of these the sides of these streams this picture really doesn't speak to how steep most of these corridors are that are directly adjacent to these lines very very steep which is another reason we want to stay out of them um, from a disturbance and a water quality this is obviously with this, with this 25 foot strip and in some cases more, this is gonna help trap and reduce the pollutant load that's gonna be coming to these, these streams. I mean, these streams are the arteries for the most part that go into the lake. So protecting these is a significant line of defense in protecting what's ultimately gonna get in, into the lake. And then last but not least, it's gonna provide a screen, some separation between these parallel cul-de-sacs. Most of these cul-de-sacs are on the same profile. So at each point on one road, at the same point on the next road, the elevation is generally the same. All these ridges are kind of fall, they descend at the same rate. So there could be a scenario, um, if, there's too much, if there's too much clearing, that someone could see from their back porch from one to the next. So we wanted to be sure that there was something that was preserved so that someone that's last to buy the lot doesn't look up and say, well, I can suddenly see my neighbor in his shorts on his back porch. Moving along, just in summary, um, for y'all, the density on this thing, I think this is as good as you could ask for when it comes to exceeding the standard. Um, you know, one acre my whole career, I thought that one acre on the lake, you know, albeit for on-site sewage disposal, was big in the grand scheme of things. I mean, you can put a lot on a one acre lot from a, a great big enormous house with a great big driveway and still get the field lines on there with 100% expansion on it with a lot of room left. So the people that wrote that one acre requirement were smart and did not push the envelope, but we're double that. Um, the second and third bullet points, when we first got on board and started working on this project, um, I personally had a concern that the new framework ordinance may have been adopted, the new late front framework ordinance may have been adopted when we got to this point. Uh, so we had to be careful to not design with current standards and then have to look up and redesign it with the new framework standard. So from a lot width perspective, 85 feet, which is still consistent with current R1 standards, with 239 feet average lot width. I mean, almost three times the required minimum front, front lot width. Um, and then the configuration allows for, I mean, we can comfortably accommodate the maximum densities, all of these buffers, which include late front buffers in the new ordinance, ground coverage ratios, which are pretty toothy compared to the ground, ground coverage ratios of today, today's ordinance. Um, we're abiding by all that. Again, no mass grading, the ridges align, the roadways align with the existing ridge features. I know most of y'all may have not have seen this layout until now, but um, in a quick glance, you wouldn't have noticed this, but we have no satellite lots on this project, not a single one. Out of 190, all of them are straight up. We didn't run to the end of these cul-de-sacs and jam lots where they didn't deserve to go, not one single satellite lot. lot. And again, we're preserving these ravine uh, and stream corridors directly adjacent to the lake. I'll answer any questions I have. You said you, uh, 
individual, Mr. Rumsey, individual system for life. You know, I think the we're the next step is to engage our our souls, guys, and I think the the likely restriction is could be some shallow rock, but based on some some quick some quick sampling and some adjacent projects that we worked on in this area. Um, the soil looks on the surface, and according to USGS uh, online soil surveys, it looks remarkably well. So, there, I think out of 197 lots, uh, and we won't test all 197. I think the first phase will take all those down, obviously, to get the permit for the first phase. There'll be a few outliers that it's, I think, statistically, we won't be able to avoid it. A mound or shallow placement. I think for me, most of the questions that I have, you kind of answered them. And obviously, this is a very large development, and our, our, I think one of our concerns originally was our, you know, how we handle the, the site work, the building, home building when it begins, and disturbance of any potential impact on the on the lake. And, and I mean, I think I've seen from our conversation and what you presented today that. It, Appears that that is very important to the developers, and you made a very stringent effort to try to make sure that wasn't a concern of ours. Um, and typically, we would we hear density is the word we hear a lot around here. And uh, I appreciate the effort of the developers and you guys to not just pack a bunch of houses. In. So I, that's not it's more of a comment than a question. But um, again, I appreciate the effort of, of you and your team. I'm going to echo Mr. Chairman's statements in that when we discussed, obviously we were concerned this larger development, and with our new code and for our new code changes we were going to make, we were trying to see, we tried to engage y'all to see what we could do to be better. Um, the things that you did on your own prior to getting to the meeting and, and, and bills, you know, we were concerned about grading and infrastructure. Concerned about during house building, which the city is proactive in that during the roads control, and more importantly, from my standpoint, was post construction and what you what you're doing with the buffer zone. Um, I think is is I, I I I think any more development on the lake needs to seriously consider and look at this one as a benchmark. So I commend, I commend you for your design. Any any questions for the petitioner? I think we've had more comments and questions, but. It, here he is, and if y'all have any, please feel free to ask now. We do have a few people that did sign up to speak, so uh, any any questions for a petitioner? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, the first person who signed up is Joseph Cox. Joseph Cox, uh, 5 College Park, Tuscaloosa, 401. Um, commission, I represent Jennifer and Josh Holyfield. Um, the big hole in the plat is theirs. Uh, they uh, lived in town and wanted to move out to the country, and uh, they, it was just lot one, which is theirs, and the one next to it. Um, but they're not here to oppose uh, this plat. They understand that this property is, is going to be developed. The only thing we are asking is there is an easement that goes down to Sexton Bend Road. And you're going to have 197 lots up there, and we want to make sure we don't become a cut through. Um, so we are just proposing that there would be a note on the plat stating that there will be no access along that 25-foot strip to the subdiv subdivided property. Okay. Thank you. We'll bring that up with the petitioner. Okay. Mr. Chairman, next person is Sandra Quinn. My husband, Tim Quinn, and I, we live on 1366 Lewis Spur, which is up there, <laughs> where, where the little blue area is right there. Can um, staff, can staff like know, circle like, that for us, please? Yeah, that's a, that and the right next to it. It's split in two, but we own all of that. Two lot subdivision. Okay. 
Um, our concern is there's a common area G at the back there where that proposed road is. We would like to know what that, no, the other Uh, we would like to know what that common area would be um, because we're concerned about the integrity of the land as well. We have right at 20 acres there. Um, we have two creeks on the property. We have two spring fed ponds, so we are definitely concerned about the water situation there. The land itself is very uh, sandy and, and like shell rock around there so it you know it could be very hard to develop safely I would like to see as they're talking about integrity used in conserving the land there um, and the traffic I mean if we're talking about 197 homes we're talking about at least 200 people on a road that only has two lanes forever the road that I have to access to get to mine, I have to scoot over to somebody else's coming down the road, which they're not going to be on Lewis Road or Lewis Spur. But even if you put that amount of traffic out on Section Bend Road, it's two lanes. It doesn't open up into a third lane until you come across the spillway. And we're, out, and we're zoned for county school, so we would have to take into account we're going to get some more city school traffic. If I leave even 10 minutes late, it can make me 30 minutes late to work right now as it is because there's no other route unless they hurry up and build that bridge across off of McWrights Ferry Road. We have no other way to get out. So it's a lot, a lot of traffic up there. And what are the time zones here? When are they going to start the construction and... You know, just how they're going to control that is a big concern for us. Um, let me see. Um, and the utilities, they said they're going to bring city water out there. And do I understand that it will be septic system? Okay. Um, and the zoning, so they just leave the rest of us in that little hole. We'll just be in the county, and we have to fight our way. <laughs> out to school because we have to drive all the way over to County Hall to get our kids to school. So, anyway. Um, let's see. I think that's about all I have. Just integrity <coughs> and traffic are major concerns and, and our water situation. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. I believe that was it. Anyone else care to speak for or against this petition? Please feel free to... Uh, no. Anyway, my name is Bill Buchanan. I live at ten six one nine. You on the other list? Bend. You on the next one? You on the okay, sorry, <laughs> I signed up on the wrong one. Okay. And I guess my question is very similar to hers. You, you, you're figuring how many cars in one hundred ninety-seven? Uh, Mr. Buchanan, yeah. speak to us in the microphone. Okay, well, I, so, yeah. I was going to ask him uh, how many cars are you figuring with one hundred ninety-seven? I think we average about two, two per. So that's 400 cars. So surely there's been some traffic studies done or something, hasn't there? We'll have to ask the petitioner or ask the engineer. We have we have received a traffic study with this development uh, from a, a Skipper Consulting. I think most of you on the board have heard of this. This uh, it's a fairly well known firm in Alabama, uh, and their their conclusion. Uh, is that the level of service of the roads will not change with this development. That's interesting because I get stuck at McPike's uh, Ferry Light and can't even cross the dam every morning around 7.30. So, do you know how far it is from there all the way to the light across the dam? I mean, they, 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 that ain't a once in a morning event. In fact, you either get out there before 7 o'clock or you get out there after 8. Or you're stuck. Uh, so I'll really disagree with that survey. But from what you're telling me, they've assumed they hadn't put out anything out done in counts or anything, correct? I received that study today, and I have not thoroughly vetted it. I read the conclusion, 
And then that was the conclusion of the report. Um, and, and, and that's just, you know, like I said, I received that report today. Well, I understand about developing land. I'm, my family's in the land business, so. Uh, but I worry when all of a sudden you got a really winding road going from Sexton Bend from right where they are, and all of this turns on to Sexton Bend, turns from Lewis and further down. And then you're going to go through, I call it the rattlesnake bends, <laughs> before you get all the way to the stop. Could we, way could stop we see there. the image that's a little further out so we can see all the... Mike, the, the, the yeah, previous, yeah, it's you. to the east of where he's shown. Mike, previous person brought up, and they did too. The McWrights Ferry Road is 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 what's the status, status of it? Um, we've already taken bids. The bids been awarded. Um, contractors probably in the process of procuring materials. I don't know exactly when the uh, notice to proceed is, but it, I'm, I'm sure it's here within the next month. Is it a one year, two it's two year, year it's two a two year, year project. project. Yes, sir. Now, is this the part that's going to go down under and come back yeah. on the new bridge yeah. that comes across? Mm -hmm. Well, that will certainly help a heck of a lot. <laughs> yeah. it, uh, it will. It, anyway, yeah. I'm, I'm just I'm more concerned with traffic than anything else. And uh, let's see. Also, Westerveld has some property south of Sexton Bend. Do you know if it is on a development plan or not? It's been subdivided. No, no. That came before us. I know of no plans that have been it has submitted. Been subdivided, hasn't it, Dina? I've, uh, the, the the part that borders our property has, I'm pretty sure, has been platted, and we we've had it. So at before some point, us. you've got a lot more traffic coming out yeah. so when it gets developed. So anyway, those are it is thoughts. a terrible Thank road. You. I can I can certainly vouch for you. Uh, it's a terrible <coughs> road. It's a Sexton Spin is a yeah. terrible road. It's a, it's a road. shame it can't be improved it's somewhat. Even. Anyone else care to speak for or against the petition? Please come forward. Staff? Work with staff. They'll get it to you. My name is William Miller. I purchased some property to the west of this development on Lake Tuscaloosa and I'm permitted to build a house on the lake and I'm in favor of this. Um, I think it's a good thing for the area, a good thing for the city and I'm all for it. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anyone else care to speak for or against? Okay. Mr. Duncan, you want to come back up and um, address some issues that were raised, please? Yeah, so Mr. Cox's concern um, over the easement usage, can you back up and just give me a little piece of white margin? Okay, so um, quickly just explain. So the, the area that we're talking about is, is right here. So that is, I'm just going to draw over here on the side. So you've got, this is Sexton's Bend out here. This is the flagpole portion for his client's lot. This is the Livingston lot, which is part of our development. Each of these two strips is 25 feet in width, for a total of 50 feet. So that entire makeup is 50 feet, over which is platted and access easement. So they share a driveway that's centered about their common property line. So their concern is obviously no traffic flowing back through that incidentally. So we're fine with the condition on the, on the plat that'll state that um, no more than one lot can use that access. So that'll give the Livingstons the ability, if for some reason they look up and want to divide their 10 acres 20 years from now, only one lot can use that driveway. The second would have to come in off of the new road. So that, I mean, we're not giving up any, any more than we got now, if that, if that makes any sense. Um, I assume Mr. Cox is okay with that. Um, I, think we're, I think we're saying the same thing. Um, moving on, a common area G. So that area, I think Caitlin drew it, but it's this feature right here. Um, topographically, right there, that area is, is pretty steep, and we didn't want to we didn't want to grade right up to the property line and have a, a slope that would be more or less uh, naked at the end of the day. So we turned it into common area uh, to be able to, to heavily plant this. 
so that this area ends up being screened at, at the end of the day. It's too narrow. Just topographically, that road has got to go right there. There's really no other other ridge feature in that in that area that we could uh, penetrate through with the road. Uh, so again, we want to screen it. Um, so back on the traffic, um, to Mike's point, Skipper Consulting did do our traffic uh, impact survey. Um, it was unfortunate that we just got it submitted today. Um, with doing the traffic counts around Thanksgiving and Christmas was extremely tough. Um, all those traffic count data had to be collected. When school's in session, otherwise we're going to get falsely low numbers. And so working around Thanksgiving and the holidays and then doing the analytical work behind the counts is why we got it today. But we, we made an endeavor on the front end to get it, um, if nothing else, in summary. But we submitted the entire report um, yesterday. And so that re report um, spoke to the levels of service. And y'all heard me say this a hundred times on levels of service. So these impact surveys, they look at what happens with additional volume at intersections, what happens with additional volume just on straight section roadways where there's no intersections involved. We analyzed both. On Sexton's Bend Road, um, we did counts and future predictions at the entrance road. Here, um, the intersection of Lewis and Sexton's Bend, and then an additional one, two, and then a third one over here before the curve at um, Sexton's Bend where it hits Sexton's Bend Cutoff Road. And in addition to that, uh, two more segments were studied on the Rattlesnake Bend portion, I think it was called, of Sexton's Bend, and then the intersection of New Watermelon and Old Watermelon Road. Um, all these roads, albeit, are classified as low-volume roadways, um, which the, the analytical criteria is, is more stringent. The level of service was at an A today, and it's in an A with the full build life of this project. These guys prepared this um, report consistent with national standards, and it says what it says. Um, it can be disagreed with, I presume, but it's, the facts are there with the traffic counts. Um, and then the days that, that they were that they were counted. Um, as far as Lewis Road goes, one thing that we we fought with, and I'll say this is probably getting us to this point. It's something that delayed us a couple of months because just from a, a flow perspective, these developers did not want the main entrance of this project to be off Lewis Road or Lewis Spur. They didn't want it. Um, they wanted to be off Sexton's Bend and build. Uh, uh, an entrance that's eye-catching, that's pleasing to the eye, that's not interfered with optically with anything else you've got to drive by to get to it. It's the entrance to the neighborhood. Um, we intend it to be that way. All of these phases two and three are interconnected, if you'll notice. There's phase one connection, phase two, phase two, Connection ultimately to phase three. And this big entrance is right here. So all these are interconnected. None of these are going to have to rely on um, Lewis Spur or Lewis Road um, for access. Now, if someone buys a lot right there, are they going to choose to go out Lewis Road as opposed to drive back through here? I can't speak to that. I will tell you the traffic forecast. Uh, took into account um, distribution both in and out, accounting for some traffic on Lewis Spur Road. Again, it was done by the standard. How many would go straight out? How many would go back through the neighborhood? I don't know. Um, but those that distribution was taken into account. Um, but I'll, I'll stress that these roads are linked um, all the way through. Um, and uh, again, I'll go back in terms of the, the level of service. Um, Sexton's Bend Road all the way to New Watermelon. That road's got 24 feet of asphalt with, in most cases, four to five feet of usable shoulder. We're nowhere close to exceeding the sectional capacity of that 24-foot wide road. Nowhere close. I mean, we're taught we'd have to get in the tens of thousands of more vehicles a day to even get close to changing the level of service.
That's right. The main amenity area. Some of these other areas, we're still talking about maybe some um, secondary playgrounds. Just geographically, their space, uh, in, mainly in the future phases, so that you know the people aren't having to come all the way back to the south end uh, to get to a playground. We've got some opportunities, uh, especially on the northern end, to do some little pocket parks. Um, we're going to study those as we get further down the road. Thank you. Any any questions for petitioner? I think you answered the questions that were raised during the. Opposition or questions about the development. I agree. Thank you, Mr. Duncan. <clears throat> I think we're um, my clients are agreeable to the idea that there can be one lot using that easement, but because I'm a lawyer and details matter, as we saw in the last case, I would just also want to put in the condition that there will be no public paved connection between the public road. And the easement road, if that makes sense. Public. So they can have a driveway going out the back, but there won't be a, a, a connection um, approved sometime in the future if lot one were ever to be subdivided, which is what we're concerned about, um, connecting that that easement uh, and whatever that road is. Mr. Duncan, I think that's what we heard from you, wasn't it? I think we're in agreement. Yeah, I'm just I, wanting I, to. I think that's what I understood him to say. Yeah, I, we're still saying the same thing. This is Seth Livingston. I um, owned that. I owned the lot right there, lot one, lot one, and lot two. So, I mean, that's, we're moving up there. That's going to be our lot. We're never going to subdivide it. We're not, we're going to let that area grow up right there. We're not, because we don't want to keep it up. We're going to let it grow up, and we're never going to use it. Only thing I'll ever do is if, I got to put my trash can at the end of our, our easement. I'll just drive, <laughs> drive out, and drop my trash off, and so they can pick it up off the back. But we're going to let that grow up, so we don't plan on ever selling or ever letting them use that easement. Okay, we're, we're getting there, there side, we're there, getting there, side. There, there we'll Bring the conversation like, back here to the podium, please. No, no, no. So, Mr. Duncan, right. are we all are we all in agreement with? Yes, sir. Yeah. Fair enough. Thank so you very much. Right. So, Commissioner, to make that clear <laughs> and answer what Joseph was saying. <laughs> To make that clear and to answer what Joseph was saying, we could do something like condition on the fact that only lot one will use the access easement. No, a total of only one lot ever will be able to use that, and there will be no road connection to the public road. I'm going to need Mr. I'm going to be. Me. All right, let's 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 bring the conversation back here. I want to ask Mr. Woodson for verbiage on that when we make this motion. Um, well, I mean, <laughs> you think, hey, you're an attorney. You think you can't figure it out? You think I can? Have we got an agreement as to how you want that worded? All right, give it to us. Let me write it down. Come on, the, come, come up to the podium. Yeah. <coughs> That'd just be just fine. Can you, can you, can you write it down like in 30 seconds? No more than one. Right, yeah. So condition that the easement uh, shown between Lot 1 and Sexton Ben Road will never be allowed to serve more than one lot and that the public road will not connect to the easement. That's correct. We've got that written down. Okay. I'd like to say, I mean, you just got to tell me what to say. You got <laughs> You didn't say a word about trash can. <laughs> All right, Commissioner, I think we've uh, heard from the public, we've heard from the petitioner, we've heard the counter. I'm assuming we're at a point where we can close discussion to the public and have a conversation amongst ourselves and take a vote. We'll hold off on. You're going to write that verbiage down well, for we'll me? Just stated, the, Sorry? We'll just as stated at the podium. As, as, as stated, stated at the podium. At the podium. Okay, as, as stated. stated. Fair enough. Good enough for me. All right. I, again, I think this is uh, quite the development, and I think uh, we've got neighbors that are excited about it. There are some challenges, of course, but I like the fact that developers did not try to just maximize for density purposes. They are coming with a very nice development, and 
I applaud engineering, our engineering, working with engineering, planning for the future, and one, protecting the lake, protecting the runoff, protecting the quality of that. And I, I agree with Mr. Harrison that we're worried about it in, in, in site work, home development, continued post post development because it is again a major source of our drinking water in the city of Tuscaloosa. So again, I, I think it's a hats off to developers and the and the neighbors to work together on, on this on this project. So my comments. Any one else care to make any comments? Having heard none, mission before us we have S0223 Emerald Edge. 6196 to residential lots. There are four variance requests. Engineering has no issues with. And we will make it all conditional upon what was stated at the podium. Do I have a motion and a second? Motion to approve. Yes. Mr. Rumsey. Yes. <coughs> yes. 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 Motion approved. Mission for the annexation of 394 acres located north of Tuscaloosa. On West Mr. Of Chairman, yes, um, I want to interject something before you make the vote on the annexation, please. And this is related to the annexation. Can you put the annexation map back up? The one that's colored. I would I would like for the annexation to include the roadway to Sexton Bend. And the and the, and the infra, any any drainage infrastructure, uh, I see an issue if if part of the entrance road is still in the county, and then all the remainder of the roads are in the city from a maintenance perspective. Is does do we is that going to be any kind of challenge to to let the roadway that 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 is not shaded green on the map be annexed in as well? When you say that, is that Sexton Men Road, the entrance? Right I'm, main I'm entrance? talking all the way out to so Sexton. So you'll Men. you'll see that red area at the bottom where they show their entrance I'm, I'm road. I'm talking about this this road here. That's proposing to not be annexed. The right, the way Everything the way it was presented, it's not annexed. Yeah, that makes sense. So I would like for that to be annexed with the rem remainder of the public infrastructure improvements, so that there's no issue about who maintains that segment of the road. With that lot one sense. and lot two yeah. staying out. That's correct. Yeah, we'll, yeah. We'll, we'll reflect in the legal descriptions that that yellow yeah. tail will be included in the in the annexation. That's an, is, Thank that, you. is that an easement now? Or will, no, it's will, public will right away. Public, public road right away. Okay. Yeah. No, but it, okay. We just want it to be in the city instead of the county. Yeah. Okay. okay. So the petitioner does stipulate that. Particularly if I've got to give a right of way use permit for the, the, the entryway, I need all that. I'll need that, I'll need that in the city. Staff, you go with what petitioner has agreed to? Yes. Okay. Yes, that's good. All right. So, annexation uh, 0123. Uh, do I have a motion and a second? Motion. Second. Ms. Horsley? Yes. 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 Motion approved. Welcome to the city. All right, Commission, next companion case we have is companion case C. This consists of an annexation and an industrial rezoning. <coughs> we'll wait just one moment. Come on with it. Keep going? We can go. All right, starting with the annexation, we've got AN0223. This is to annex approximately 39.85 acres, and it's located south of 9511 Highway 82 West. It is west of 9200 Energy Lane and it's adjacent to the existing Tuscaloosa County Industrial Park. Here's a vicinity map showing where that is. You've got the airport to the west, or to the east, excuse me. Here's an aerial view of that property. And in framework, this is identified as a primary expansion area. And it does conform to the future land use character map as industrial. Uh, this is for an economic development project and for water and sewer service. As always, the eight points of evaluation criteria were outlined and talking with uh, other city departments. 
Office of the City Engineer and City Attorney had no issues, and Environmental Services stated that services will not be provided. Any questions on the annexation before the rezoning? All right, jumping right into it, we've got Z0223. The Tuscaloosa County Industrial Development Authority is petitioning to rezone that 39.85 acres um, from the R1 if annexed to MH. Again, our vicinity map and the aerial view. This is that property undeveloped adjacent to the industrial park. Again, this is for that economic development project and the water and sewer connection. And this is a site, pla site plan of how they would like this to operate. This is a rail yard. This does conform to framework. This is identified as industrial. And here on the future land use character map, it's adjacent to industrial as well as flex employment center. Here are the permitted uses within MH. It's kind of hard to see, I apologize for that, but it will be the bolded X's to the right of this. Do you have any questions for staff? Ma'am. All right. Petitioner. Good evening, I'm Justice Smith, Executive Director of the Tuscaloosa County Industrial Development Authority. Uh, I'm here to support this, and ask for your support for this uh, rezoning and annexation. Um, as staff mentioned, this is a uh, size located northwestern uh, quadrant of the airport industrial park. It's in close proximity to a number of uh, various heavy industrial users. As the commission is well aware, the uh, access to affordable and reliable rail transportation service is a critical component to uh, recruiting industrial customers and users. And it's, a, it's a vital in terms of our ability as a community and as an organization to attract new jobs and investment to Tuscaloosa County. Uh, toward that end, we've been working with Watco and Alabama Southern Rail to locate a property which would allow them to <clears throat> increase capacity of their existing service and also alleviate strain uh, in, their, in their existing service, all of which will result in improved uh, customer service to existing industries and also allow us to uh, potentially recruit new, new users. Uh, at this time, if the commission is uh, agreeable, I'd like to introduce you to two representatives from the railroad, uh, Cody Gilliland and Kane Green. Kane is the general manager of uh, Alabama Southern Rail and Watco, and he will answer any questions you may have about the general plan of the proposal. Okay. Good evening. Uh, Kane Green, General Manager, Alabama Southern Railroad. We're a Watco company. Uh, just a uh, point of fact, this railroad train yard uh, out in this area uh, will actually alleviate some of the congestion that we have in our current rail yard here in downtown Tuscaloosa. Uh, currently, right now, around 80% of the day, uh, 16th Street, 18th Street, 20th Street in the West End, Tuscaloosa are currently blocked. The south end of our rail yard is uh, unfortunate the way that it was designed. Um, that's the way we have to switch inbound and outbound trains coming into the area away from Mississippi and out of Birmingham. Uh, this brings uh, approximately 80% of that traffic out to a more rural industrial area. Um, alleviating block crossings, excessive horn blowing in the west side of town, um, and just like Justice said, it uh, helps us increase our capacity and better serve customers in the Tuscaloosa area. Um, there was some concern about uh, a blocked crossing in this area, which uh, it's not on the map, but uh, Energy Lane uh, would be, it's a one way in, one way out, serves several industries in that area. Uh, it's approximately 2,700 feet from our mainline switch where the track bottlenecks out. Uh, that's around 50 car lengths. Uh, these tracks here in the yard hold 34. So if we pull a train track completely out of the yard, that energy lane would not be blocked. Um, uh, Boone Boulevard, uh, what I call Rose Boulevard, um, that was a uh, area of concern as well. Um, that's even further past Energy Lane. And then Bill George Road, which is behind this. Uh, we currently use Bill George Road as an access point for locomotives because of our capacity issues in our Tuscaloosa yard. When we bring an inbound train in from Birmingham to make room for that train in our Tuscaloosa yard, we have to shove the outbound train out of Bill George Road. And then once that train comes into Tuscaloosa, we leave it out. 
but this yard, it actually alleviates parking trains at Little George. So, um, and that's all, that's all I have, key points, unless you guys have any questions. How much, I'll try to say this right, well, how much, let's say capacity, how, how much bleed off will that take off the west side as far as? <laughs> Around 80%. Wow. So the yard here on the west side is a 300 car rail yard. Uh, this gives us an additional 330 car spots. Uh, this is a double-phased approach. Uh, the first phase is the 330. Um, the second phase would, would increase capacity double-fold, giving us up to 700 cars in this yard. Um, all of our local customers in Tuscaloosa, their, their rail cars will still be kept in Tuscaloosa Yard but all of the switching that blocks all the crossings on a daily basis will be moved out to this location. So the concern about energy lane, you will not block them switching? Now, so we will not block them switching. Um, when trains are in transit moving out, of course, that, right. tra that, that road is going to be blocked. So you'll never be parked in front of Charlie. We, we will not park trains on how many linear feet do you how many linear feet of storage do you have here? Um, was it thirty four thousand five seventy, I believe it's there on the map. Total store, I can't total read length. It. It's fuzzy, yeah, it's fuzzy. You say thirty four thousand <laughs> linear feet? Yes, sir. How many how, how big is this site? It's uh just under forty acres. Like thirty four thousand. That's a lot in a little. Uh, we've got uh, a really, really crackpot engineering team internally that uh, put a lot of thought in this design. Anything else, guys? Yes. Can you can you um, say again what streets will be um, will have some relief from this annex? Sixteenth Street, Eighteenth mm -hmm. Street, Twentieth, and Twenty First. I have heard so many complaints, and so this is this is going to definitely be good news for parts yeah. of my community. Primarily, the, the the road crossing that is blocked any time of the day is 16th Street, right behind the jail. Uh huh. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Um, now I'm not going to say that there's not still going to be train traffic in the area, mm -hmm. but this will alleviate all the switching that that blocks those crossings on a daily basis. I see. That's still good news. At uh, this time, I'd like to invite Cody Gilliland uh, with Watco Sales and Marketing. Uh, he represents our railroad as well. He's got some information for you guys also. Good evening. Cody Gilliland, Commercial Director for Watco. Um, so when we talk about the car loads that are becoming in, passing through here, we're not going to be adding any additional commodity, any, any new type of hazmat material. What travels from... Artesian, Mississippi to Brookwood, Alabama now will remain the same. There will not be any changes. Uh, we're still engineering. We're still in the engineering phase. All of the engineering that we do are going to follow the guidelines set by Watco, the Kansas City Southern, who is the actual railroad owner, and the Federal Rail Administration. And then lastly, on the environmental piece, we're going to follow all local, state, and federal rules, regulations, and guidelines on, the, on those uh, environmental aspects. Any questions for us? Thank you. Thank you. Petitioner, have any more comments to make? I think Cody Gillen's already spoke. Aaron Green? Okay, okay, both of y'all spoke. All right, next person, Margaret Purcell. Commissioners, staff members, neighbors. I'm Margaret Purcell. I live in Coker. My husband and I run a farm. Our house is located at 11160 Lake Robinwood Road. I write, I come to you today, I wrote to you earlier, because 10 days ago, we received notice of this plan, which can materially affect not only our quality of life, but also our ability to earn a living through our farm. Additionally, Katie Farms 
is not just important to us as individuals, it has also been recognized by the state legislature with resolution because of its impact to the quality of life for our state. And we have been featured nationally, locally, and within the state as a prime example of a modern farming organization. I am not just concerned, though, about me and my family, but I'm also concerned about water quality, the, the watershed that leads into the Black Warrior, and also how will contamination of our farmland affect the customers in our community who so heartfelt um, believe in the products that we provide that are grown locally, sold locally, and that allow individuals in school groups to come to our farm to see what is it like to grow the food that everyone eats. This may seem like an aside to you, but you will never know the joy that a child experiences when they come to our farm and I take them to a chicken coop where they pick up an egg that has just been deposited and say, Farmer Margaret, why is this egg warm? And I explain to them, eggs don't come from refrigerators. <laughs> eggs come from chickens. And when they lay them in that box, they are warm. Ladies and gentlemen, I am not against progress. But I believe this particular choice for placement of this line is not the best option available. There are other options available not that far from here, for example, mental health land, which would not have the impact on the water system or on our farm or on our community, state, and nation as a whole by ruining our ability to be this model farm. I'm not saying that these gentlemen and the economic concerns, including folks, I get it, what it's like when trains block the road. When he talked about Bill George Road, that's right by the entrance to our farm. And when a train parks there for two hours, there's no way for me to get to my farm or my house. I, I feel for that. I'm saying this answer has been placed in the wrong area. Let's choose something to accommodate these gentlemen and their economic concerns. These folks, our neighbors, who have problems with the rail just as we do, but let's not destroy a farm, a livelihood, and a quality of life that our community is losing. How many of you grew up on a farm? Not as many as we used to have. Do you know the average age of a farmer in the United States is 59 years old? Ain't nobody coming along to dig in the dirt, to feed the cows, to pick up the eggs from the chickens. When you guys get rid of us, you guys are getting rid of farming. These folks can go somewhere else and have just the impact that they plan to have. We're not going anywhere. I'll be 61 on Monday. My husband is in his mid-60s. We're the last hurrah. When you get rid of us, there's no 20-year-old rushing in to take our place. There's nobody else bringing hydroponic lettuce grown locally to your community. There's nobody selling you free-range eggs where you could go to the farm, meet the farmer, and see the chickens running across the field. Ladies and gentlemen, there is this guy overseas that I've read about a long time ago. And he was in England. You've probably heard of him. He was kind of powerful. And he said, once in a while in your life, you are given the opportunity 
to rely on all of your experience and all of your knowledge to do something really important. That fellow was Winston Churchill, and he was a pretty smart guy. And what I would like to say to you is, with your wisdom and your experience and the information that all of us can provide if we work together, don't kill us to help them. Let's figure out another way to work together so that you don't have to acquire this land, which by the way, not too long ago, there was soybean growing there. We use soybean a lot. We eat soybean a lot. Our cows eat soybean. Let's accommodate all of us. Let's help them find another parcel of land. Let's save this as natural land, and let's not contaminate the river system. And guys, I'm going to confess my sins. I'm just a farm chick from Coker. I didn't know I was supposed to have to sign on both pieces of paper, so I may want to come up here and talk again when you get to that other little paragraph under here because it's just too important. It's too important to save a way of life. And these guys have other options. Thank you for considering my request. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, the last person we have signed up Mr. Mike Smith. Okay. I think you were the last one that signed up. Uh, does anyone else in the audience care to speak for or against this petition before we allow the petitioner a chance to come back up and address any concerns he might have heard? Okay. Petitioner, any care to? Staff, can we see where Katie Farms is in relation to this? All right, so the piece of property that we're looking at is right up here. Katie Farms, I'm, I'm not sure, but forgive me. Okay. To the, can you put to the west. This... Sorry, we can't we can't hear you from the you, you can audience. come up. You can come to the We all know this used to be mental health property. Name and address of the record, please. Yeah, okay. This used to be mental health property. The site where the star is used to be a lake that was filled in. There used to be a, a large lake out in, and you still have the overseat. As you see the little crook that runs out there, that is our property. And we bought the other piece of property just joining to that back in November. Uh, gentlemen, ladies, if there ever was a swamp, that is a swamp. Uh, about a mile up the road from there, the state of Alabama owns a track of land where the old boys colony used to be, which is far more better, if I can use that word ground, to put this train yard on. It runs right beside it. Is it just because of the IDA owns the land and not the state of Alabama? Is that the reason for the sale? We tried to buy this land several years ago and was told it wasn't for sale. I tried to buy that 39 acres and was said it'll never be sold. It's not for sale. Now it's being sold. But if that'll hold a train up, then the Gulf of Mexico, I guess, will hold them up too because the water table is only about six foot. Just across that property line, we have three whales on our property. One of them is a hand dug whale, which is six and a half foot which is a little bit taller than me. We have an artesian well, which is 50 feet, which produces over 300 gallons of water per minute. So you know how high the water table is there. But our main concern is the runoff, if this thing is approved, which we hope and pray is not, the runoff from that is going to go into <coughs> Big Creek. And if you look, there's a creek running right down beside that property as well. You know, Big, Big Creek is a point to the next piece of property. That is Jay's Creek. There's another creek where the point runs out next to the star on our property line, which is Big Creek. So, as far as the watershed, there are three creeks that run together in there. 
but there's a, a lot better place. We're not against these guys at all. But the placement of this rail yard, we hope we're not back to, up here before you if this does go through and say, I told you so. Uh, it won't work. Uh, we have contacted the several groups. The Environmental Working Group is a group, I'm sure y'all have heard of them. Uh, they've agreed to help us with this upon the first shovel of dirt, you know, as far as the environmental impact on it. Uh, we have asked them briefly, we only learned of this 10 days ago, to help us with this, but, you know, their concerns is once the first shovel of dirt is moved, or once it's approved, we're on board. And we've been a member of that organization for 20 some odd years. But we're not here to threaten anybody. We're just here to say, hey, let's move this thing down a mile and go after that piece of property. It'd be so much more better. We know we gotta have growth, but this here needs to be maintained. Agriculture land. You know, those train yards and cars in there, if they're full of oil or whatever, or foreign corn, you only need that services about once a, once a week. Fill your car up and go to the grocery store. But a farmer, you need us three times a day. So, you know, as they say, go figure. So I urge you to let them look at some place. We, we're not against these gentlemen at all. In fact, we let them park their cars when they do this train trip, courtesy. No problem when I mean cars, pickups, and trucks, and so forth on a ride away. But if we would move this down, there's a lot more better examples to look at this besides this dot right here. That, was, that has been farmed by the, a farmer up in uh, north side for 50 years. He grew soybeans on it. Before that, it was the state of Alabama Mental Health where they provided the food for, every, for all the state uh, hospitals and so forth. We need our ag land. On average, the United States loses 1,500 acres a day in ag land. And our population is expected to cripple in the next 50 years. So the only way we're going to be able to provide food is from our foreign government. And when they, and they, and when they provide us the food, they say who eats or dies. So I thank you for all your consideration and interest. Appreciate it. Is, excuse me, is Katie Farms, is the border, is that the yellow property on our map? Uh, Ms. Yeah. Prince, I actually just outlined it for you. It's that blue line, no, everything. No, 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 no. We go all the way to the green point. That's not the border. Everything is right here. See where the star is? Are you the Fleener property yes, as well? Is. Okay, got yes, it. We own two parcels, and actually we own three. If we're serving one parcel, we're within 50 feet. I walked it off. We're, we are, that's us. That's what they're saying. And as you right. see, about 10 high quality of the property. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And then you've got the 800 train car. We're just placing the train car there. Okay. Thank you. 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 Please come forward. Would the petitioner care to address? Mike Smith, uh, I'm the attorney representing uh, the Industrial Development Authority. My address is 701 22nd Avenue, Suite 1, Tuscaloosa. A couple of things that, that were pointed out there that I, I just want to respond to. First is that, you know, railroad is a little bit uh, of a unique, uh, a unique animal in that it is fixed and tied to where its track flow. So the availability of 40-acre parcels of land that do not have a higher and better use uh, is rare. And this is a property that is very well suited to that. If you look directly across US 82 there, you'll see the Black Warrior landfill. If you look to the east of the property, it has the star on it. That's where Stress Creek is located. A little bit further east, Town of Steel. This is a heavily industrial property already. It has a major U.S. highway running alongside it. 
And if you look at your aerial photographs, I don't know that they would show it clearly, but the red line, and again, I wish I knew better. I do this. No, ma'am, not that one. But you go back to the other slide and show them what I'm talking about. But ma'am, if you see the area there where the uh, we pointed out the little nub that sticks out there, it's relatively close. Uh, to the property line. If you look to the left over there, you'll see a red line going vertically. I, I do a Texas line or a quarter Texas line, I sure do. The farm itself is located to the west of that line. That's where the open lane is located. So what you have is from that red line all the way to the property line of the Stard property is a heavily forested area little over three-fifths of a mile from that line to the property line there. That heavily forested area, yeah. You see the open land. This is, this is the land where the uh, cursor is located now. It's right in there. The property line actually lies pretty well along the western edge of that open field that you see, just to the just to the west of Stress Creek. Okay. So, we'll try. Do I need to press anything? Okay. Yeah. The property is located really more in this area, and this is the area over here where the farm is located. So you can see the area between those two red lines is heavily forested and provides a significant buffer between the farmland and the uh, and the area where the rail will be located, rail yard will be located. That area that's being farmed is adjacent to the existing three lines of rail and is roughly two tenths of a mile away from US 82 and as I said it's a little over three tenths of a mile away from the property line of the area of the big development. With regard to environmental issues or environmental concerns, NEPA, which is the National Environmental Policy Act, designates the Federal Railway Administration as the authority for determining the environmental requirements that will be placed on this yard. They are strict just as every other environmental law in this country, and that's an area that I probably do 50% of my practice in, particularly as it deals with land and water issues uh, in the environment. Uh, this will be a, a regulated facility, and one of the things that you may have missed during the presentation from the railroad was that this, none of the, there isn't any transloading. There isn't any unloading, there isn't any offloading, there isn't any discharge from any of these cars. This is an area where cars will be brought and they will sit just as they're traveling down the railroad. There should not be any form of leakage, there shouldn't be any kind of issue that would involve uh, these cars. This is completely and totally different uh, from transloading yards such as the one up in Bessemer or the uh, facility that I represent in Perry County that unloads uh, municipal solid waste that's brought from the northeastern United States. Uh, these, this is uh, a very low risk operation. It would be considered a very low risk uh, operation from an environmental standpoint. I don't know that there were any other issues that were raised that y'all might want us to address, but we're happy to try to do that. One thing I will mention, the, the Department of Mental Health property that was mentioned as an alternative, the highest and best use of that property is significantly greater than this property. That is prime industrial property, uh, and it is property that is located adjacent to a, some, approximately a 200-acre tract that is owned by the Industrial Development Authority and could very well be used to secure 
uh, very, very nice project to receive. And so it's not something that you would want to use for a road. I got a question Just, for you. Is it, it, you're governed by the Railway Act, right? Yes, sir. So who's the governing body from an environmental standpoint in that scenario? Is it the, is it the EPA or is it the um, AD, ADM? Who would be the real governing? ADM typically is delegated where they have a, a qualifying program that's been approved by EPA. ADEM is designated to govern the environmental enforcement of federal law as well as state laws. The, the Alabama program adopts its own set of regulations and rules, statutes, things of that nature. They have to be deemed to be in conformity, at least as strict as those uh, that are in the federal law uh, for the EPA to approve them. But once the EPA approves the program, then ADEM take over that regulation. And that is the case for the water, land, and air programs. I can't really speak to the air program that much because I don't practice in that area. So one of those groups that come in, once you submit the plans and approve them or disapprove them, something like this doesn't require retention ponds or anything like that to catch runoff. I know you said nothing was gonna be loaded or unloaded, I hate to say it, but everything leaks, you know. The, uh, it is unlike, I, I can't speak to that because I haven't looked at the construction plans and haven't dealt with it. My conversations with Shane, he indicates to me that retention ponds would not be required here because of the nature of the <coughs> runoff that would come from this property. If you have an area uh, where you do not have, uh, where you do not have rainwater coming in contact with contaminants, typically you're not required to have a detention pond and a sampling point uh, for your discharge. I know there are, you can have a facility that has, uh, that has multiple different types of land associated with it, area where there is contact water, where there's non-contact water, and also where there's water that has to be collected and discharged through uh, a sanitary sewer system. Uh, in this case, my understanding is that from Kane is that the water that would be falling on this property would not be regulated. I is, just has there been that. a drainage study? I'm sorry? Is, has there been any kind of drainage study or There hasn't been evaluation? anything done as yet that I'm aware of. Engineers have done that. Okay, do you want to speak to that, Shane? You know more. So we, we have done phase one and phase two environmental studies on the property. The only environmental concern is a migrating bat that lives in the tree line. Um, that protects the trees between the months of April and October. Uh, so trees are removed between uh, up until March, not again until October. The bats actually find homes uh, in other trees, but as far as any environmental concerns, uh, the railroad, we're required to have a stormwater prevention plan uh, and a spill prevention and countermeasure control plan. Uh, I keep both of those. I also have a hazmat security plan that I submit to the federal government, uh, and we are governed by both ADEM and the EPA. Uh, in fact, we run uh, three tabletop drills with the local LEPC. Um, in regards to worst case scenario spill episodes with the railroad, uh, I'm required to, to call the EPA and run a drill call with them. Their next call is to ADEM, and within five minutes I get a phone call back from all parties on a group call, and we discuss the countermeasures to the, to the potential spill. Um, but as far as any other environmental concerns, there's we've, we've done all the studies um, on the through our engineers. <coughs> yeah, questions for? Would, have you provided that to the Katie Farms folks, that information? I got two questions. Um, one is the reason that you're putting this uh, 
I guess this loading area for the train, is it because IDA owns the property? property? Is that the reason for that? We were asked to assist in locating a place to do this, and we, we had this piece of property that was available. Okay. And what were the items that you said would be loaded? I'm sorry? What were the items that you said would be loaded? That would be loaded there? Mm -hmm. Yes. Nothing. Nothing. The trains... You know, that, so this is just a switching yard. Just yeah. uh, We move uh, just under 50,000 carloads through this corridor on an annual basis. Okay. Um, that's across this bridge. I don't know how many times you guys come across and look uh, over the river and see rail cars parked on the bridge. You don't see that anymore. Um, but it's uh, all the commodities that service all of our local customers uh, here in Tuscaloosa, plus anything that travels from East Coast into Texas and Mexico and vice versa travel through this corridor. Uh, it supports quite a large amount of our nation's economy. Um, but the answer to your question is no rail cars is being unloaded or unloaded. It's primarily a classification switching building <coughs> outbound and inbound interchange trains. Okay. So would there be any carts that would be stored there or is just Switching There's currently home. cars stored there now. They've been stored there since uh, January 1st of 2020, uh, and they are loaded Prudel tank cars. There, well, there's two sidings uh, that run adjacent to this property uh, that process Prudel uh, loads in one track and empties in another. So will you still have some cars in both locations, or will would you remove one? Uh, th that will actually move into the Tuscaloosa yard. Okay. Uh, where those cars are being stored now will move here to support the local refinery. Um, and then all of our inbound and outbound interchange trains that are processed downtown will move out to this location. Okay, got you. So what are plans for that after they move out with that? Uh, we'll still operate both yards. Uh, the, the downtown yard will just support our local train track. Okay. Uh, it'll store cars for customers in the Tuscaloosa okay. area. Okay. Uh, it'll be a staging. Co typically, customers order rail cars. They come in, and we stage them for them until they order them into their okay. plants or facilities. The Tuscaloosa yard downtown will hold those cars. Okay. The, this yard will house all the cars that travel east coast, west coast. Gotcha. All right, thank you. Any more questions for the petitioner? Anyone else? It's time to speak. Um, Ma'am, you got a question? Come, you got to come to the podium. And Again, no aspersions on these individuals, but there's one matter that they did not address, and that's maintenance of the tracks. They will be significantly increasing the number of tracks in the area, and they routinely spray pesticides and defoliants to keep those tracks clear. And all of that, and again, with due respect to boundaries and zoning commissions, um, our bees don't know that they're not supposed to fly across a boundary line to get into some sort of pesticide. And the water that flows in the land doesn't know that it's not supposed to go pick up any kind of pesticide that they've sprayed to keep their tracks clean. It's gonna flow right over to our area. So again, not saying that these individuals are trying to mislead you, but they have not presented you with the total picture of the impact of these increased rail lines. Thank you, gentlemen and ladies. Thank you. So I, I will address that concern. We do spray pesticides on our main lines. Um, that is to combat encroaching foliage and that blocks view of the train engineers, increases safety. Um, in this particular train yard, it's essentially a gravel parking lot, so there won't be any need to spray pesticides. There will be rail cars parked on these tracks preventing plants and foliage to grow. Um, and if there is a landowner that has property adjacent to our right-of-way, which is where we only spray our right-of-way, um, that can be resolved by that landowner contacting the railroad company and designating a no spray zone, uh, which where we would cut back rather than spray pesticides. And you're willing to commit to the adjacent landowner yeah, in this case I, to do that? Yes. Okay. 
Um, I've, I've actually have a few landowners that are adjacent to us in Mississippi that we can ask. Thank you. I want to ask a question. Uh, I don't know how this construction process is going to be. Uh, are y'all using a is, is a local engineering firm going to be doing this or a railroad? Who who is your design? So Watco uh, employs our own engineering firm. Um, the White Brothers. Uh, so they did the initial engineering plans uh, as far as all of the construction on the rail yard. Uh, those are all local contractors. Um, we've actually put it out for bid right now and put the bids on the third work and uh, rail yard work is accepted. So I'm, go I'm going on the assumption that you do not intend to submit any plans to the city of Tuscaloosa for review. Uh, if we are required to, yes. I'd like for you to investigate that because I think you are. Okay. Okay. I, I guess if we're, I don't know why we wouldn't be if we're annexing into the city. Uh, Mike, are you, talking, are you talking about requirements like fire hydrants and? No, the, the city of Tuscaloosa's uh, Requirements for land disturbing activity requires that any development get a land development permit. And this is a land disturbing activity, whether they intend to have a water supply or a sewer supply is, is really irrelevant. But any land disturbing activity requires a permit from the Office of City Engineer. Is this facility going to require water, sewer, power, gas? <laughs> yes, it will require all of those utilities, and we do have to submit plans for approval of the assistance. That is a for, for sure thing. Well, if you if you've got them out for bid, I would would caution you to go ahead and get them under review at our office to see if we see any any issues. Any water system that connects to the city of Tuscaloosa, you have to have a permit for your. Your contractors are not supposed to turn valves or close valves or anything on our system. When he says out of bid, that means bid for actually putting the rail tracks on the rail, not the bid for doing all the other work. This is just for us to understand the capital investment okay. for what right. this is, not an actual move forward with the project. All right, thank you. Yes, sir. Any other questions? Any other questions for staff? Any other comments for staff or questions to staff? Mike, would it be best then to wait until y'all have, have an opportunity to review those materials? No, I think this procedure is happening uh, the way it should. They they need to, to get the annexation done. Um, you know, I don't see that being that it needs to come after a plan review by my office. But that, that plan review will give us an opportunity to look at how they plan on managing the drainage and, and what measures they're taking to maybe not do stormwater detention like we normally think of, but maybe um, Diversion. containment, containment. Uh, of anything before it leaves the site. And, and in particular, you know, stormwater management in general when, when there's land disturbing activities. I, I, from my standpoint, I, I would think a yard of this size would make that part of the design some sort of containment, some sort of check basin prior to anything leaving the site. I mean, I, it just makes sense because of what, what potential products are there. Just, whether, whether we require it or whether the hell your insurance company requires it, I don't, I don't know. Somebody. It comes, stands for reason. Any other comments or questions? Okay, having heard none, permission before us we have, we're going to take the annexation first, it's listed first, so we have an annexation request, AN 0223 annexing 39.85 acres. Um, do I have a motion and a second? Motion to approve. Ms. Hornsby? Yes. 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 I'm, I'm abstaining. Right. Thank you. Yes. Yes. 
Yes. Yes. Motion approved. Commission, before us, we have a rezoning request, C0223, TCIDA, petition to rezone those acres from R1, which they come in the city as R1, to MH. Do I have a motion and a second? Motion. Ms. Hare. Yes. 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 Motion approved. <laughs> All right, Commission, we do have one standalone rezoning case this evening. And it is Z0123. Al Cavanis petitions to rezone approximately 9.41 acres located at 827th Street from RM3 to RMF1. This is in Council District 2. Here is the vicinity map showing the property. It is uh, directly adjacent to the Downs Historic District, right next to the edge as well along 10th Avenue. Here is an aerial view of the property. And here is the property itself. A little bit of history with this piece. It used to be RMF1, and back uh, post-tornado, it was zoned to RM3, which is our mixed residential. Uh, here is the adjacent northern property. Again, this is in the Downs Historic District. And then eastern, they're zoned R2. And then this is a uh, rezoning to RMF1 for proposed apartment development. And the petitioner did provide us with two schematic site plans, one showing what that site could look like with the current zoning of RM3 which is on your screen right now. And this is the proposal with RM RMF1 zoning. Another thing to note before we move into framework, uh, just on the opposite side of 10th Avenue, this happened about 10 years ago where Rosedale Court right here was zoned RM3, similar situation, they came and were rezoned to RMF1. Looking at framework, framework identifies this land as Flex Employment Center, so that does not conform to the plan. And here's that future land use character map. You see the Flex Employment underneath the star, surrounded by suburban residential. And here are those permitted uses within RMF1. Do you have any questions for staff? Yeah, can you go back to um, the current zoning of everything? How the plan would look? Or the zoning map? Zoning map, I'm sorry, zoning map. Whoa, yeah, okay, I, I just need to get some rain in here. All right, did, so what would did her, could currently be down oh. subdivision is? I'm sorry? R1, in, in, okay, all right, that's what I thought. Okay, yep. so part of it's zoned R1 and another part is zoned R4, or is that? So the piece for tonight is solely zoned RM3. To the north of it, it's all zoned R1 historic. Oh, okay. And then to the east in the bright yellow, that's residential district two. Okay. All right, any further questions for us? Can we go back to the zoning? Mm -hmm. For the current zoning, RM3 or for RMF1, which they want to do? Which they want. There we go. Is that the index? Mm -hmm. the yeah. the index? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission, Al Cabinet of Cabinet Engineering, representing Tuscaloosa Realty. Uh, it's one of the early Charlie Seeley ownership and development companies he set up years ago. Deb Seeley is here with me tonight. Uh, she and her husband, Charles Jr., are interested in redeveloping this. Uh, it's currently zoned RM3, which is one of the MX quarter zones. Uh, it basically allows three-story multifamily buildings. So we started looking at, at, at plans to redevelop um, and actually had a pre-design conference with everybody sitting at the table except Jimbo here. It's because of the way um, the 
MX zones are written, they were really more of an urban square block intersecting street layouts. Start trying to apply it to this sort of development. Each building has to be on an individual residential lot with frontage on a public street. So we, we if we if we do the RM3 development, the the access roads, the parking lots, all those actually become city streets. They become city maintained. Um, I think it's not really something the city wants to be in the business of maintaining apartment parking lots, and it precludes us from having the ability to have a gated gate, gated community here as well. We really need to have private streets. So we've got the uh, we had the pre-design conference really with with the. Uh, uh, the, the one you see on the screen here, the RM3 plan. And we came back and did one uh, after that meeting and talking with Caitlin and Zach and Haley and then Ashley as well. Of course, Mike was there representing the OCE talking about the public street aspect of it. We looked at the possibility of going back to RMF1. That's property was RMF1 since the zoning ordinance came into being. Uh, it works a lot better as RMF1, uh, not much different in the density, but the layout's a little better. We can provide more buffering uh, to the downs. We can provide more buffering to the neighborhood to the east. So uh, we can provide uh, a permanent 20-foot landscape buffer on the east property line, on the north property line. That's what you see shaded. Um, a little over nine acres, we're talking about 126 units, uh, 240 beds. Uh, just puts us density around 13 dwelling units per acre. Uh, the allowable density is 25, so we're about half the allowable density here. A uh, good bit of open space, uh, the schools and courtyards concept. Um, so we're we're not very dense, we're maintaining, well, we'd be greatly repairing, but we're maintaining this parking lot. You know, part of this parking lot, our entrance will remain where it is. Obviously, we're just reconstructing curbs, and reconstructing streets and new paving. Uh, so basically, that part of the layout will remain what it historically was. Uh, it was it's called Charleston Square when it was destroyed by the tornado in April 27, 2011. Uh, if you're anywhere close to my age, which is out in the west or bedtime, you shouldn't be up here. If you're anywhere close to my age, you knew this is Fountain Blue, which is well known as Fountain Blue. And Deb's husband, Charles Jr., actually lived down at the Houston School. So uh, they would like to redevelop it. Uh, it. The framework goes through and it becomes a flex employment zone. The Seeley family's not really into industrial development and manufacturing and that sort of thing that would be. That would be allowed in that zone. So we need to go in and develop it under the current zone. And ideally, we would prefer to go back to RMF1. I think it's better, better developed for us. I think it's better for the city as far as all the infrastructure being private instead of public. Uh, and also, I think it's better for the surrounding neighborhoods because we can provide better buffers if we go back to RMF1. So we're basically trying to more of a technicality, trying to move it back to the zoning it was, which would provide a little cleaner development. Um, Miss Lake, I can, I'll stop rambling, but I'll answer any questions you might have. How many units were there uh, before the tornado? Um, I looked back and tried to, tried to find that, and I couldn't, Deb, I don't, 144, or, it was, and I think they were all two bedroom, so 288 were 126, slightly fewer units were uh, 240 beds, so a pretty significant reduction there. This is a, these are mostly two bedroom units, there will be several one bedroom units, and there'll be eight three bedroom units, so it's predominantly a two bedroom and one bedroom proposal now, so a little little less density was there. These all be two-story buildings. The current zone allows three. We're, all, we're only proposing two. Uh, RMF1, of course, would allow multi-story, but again, we're only proposing two stories. So um, 
lower density than what was there, the same use that has always been there. Any other question for petitioner? Mr. Chairman, there's two people <laughs> sign up. One is Tom Land. Good evening. My name is Tom Land. I live at 25 to Downs, and I'm the neighborhood president. Um, in general, I don't think we're going to have a problem with having same apartments, the same type of apartments uh, that was formerly there. Um, I think our main question will be uh, the drainage. Uh, and I'd like some a little bit of information on this part of it. Uh, is this in the flood zone? And where is, is this considered floodway on the north part? The, around the drainage ditch at the north part of the floodway. Okay, go ahead. So there are there's floodway, floodway fringe, and a small area of the 500 year flood. So basically the floodway fringe boundary is here. Uh, the 500 year flood boundary, the darker hatch is here. And then the floodway is actually... Are you saying flood zone? Is the well, so, so this is flood, flood uh, this is floodway. Okay. This is floodway fringe, the 100 year floodway okay. fringe. This small section is the 500 year fringe. So Floodway, floodway fringe, five hundred year flood. Uh, there is, and as Mike Gardner talked about on the previous case, uh, this case will have a land development permit, obviously, and building permits. Uh, part of the requirement is a stormwater detention, so this site will be, this site will have, it did not previously have stormwater detention because there was well before the requirement. But to redevelop this, our plan will include stormwater. <laughs> okay, uh, and one of the things that, that has changed is obviously city code has changed. I don't think we're going to have a problem in general with, we'll be working this out over the next meeting or whatever, but about uh, screening, et cetera, that would be more toward historic district too. Uh, but this was built like you said, before there were flood regulations in 1975. Uh, and the same for the adjoining property that is for sale too. They're both were built before 1975. Um, this area originally was a creek and kind of swampy around the edges of the creek. Um, the, the issue we have is like, this was built up to, and then had a, they made this a drainage ditch instead of a creek. So we were just concerned too that there may not be any kind of building up anymore because anything that creates a hardship for other people should be addressed through flood zone regulation. And so I, I think we're concerned about this type of thing. And I don't, in your plan, I don't see anything being any worse than it was before. Um, but I think we really need to think about this in terms of how the city views this. Does the city have the right of way at that drainage area and the pipes that come through there, they have not been maintained. There's a pipe that runs from behind the downs, uh, behind Mr. Hamilton's house, that can, I think, and near to Gibbons' house. But this, there's a drainage pipe that is blocking that small ditch. And it seems like it's in disrepair. So there's some issues I have in general that are more along the lines of who's going to be dealing with this? Is this the city system, the property owner? 
uh, as we go forward. I'll uh, I'll address the I think the bulk of your comments. Um, as Al has identified, there is a floodway along the western boundary of this property, and the flood map was produced after Charleston Square Fountain Blue was 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 developed. So that floodway takes into account the the topography of the ground, the paved parking lot that was there. Uh, when the when the when the map was generated, um, we when when Al initiated this redevelopment, we we contacted or or looked in our our FEMA guidelines as to how we have to manage floodways to keep our community rating systems and our and our insurance uh, through the city, and about the only thing they're allowed to do in the floodway is to do maintenance, which means they can resurface that parking lot, but they can't raise it. If they do want to raise it or change the ground elevation, then they have to go through a process of doing a letter of map amendment, which would be a very costly and lengthy thing. And, and right now, Al's plans or conversations with me is that all they intend to do is, is to do a resurfacing of that parking lot. I also know that the city is, uh, has what we call the uh, Downs Drainage Project, and it addresses stormwater that drains from the north. Uh, so that's that is in concert with things that are going on now. You mentioned storm pipes that maybe are on the south end of the Downs that are not being maintained. Um, you know that's that's something that I'll I'm going to address tomorrow with our our maintenance crews to go out and take a look at it. Uh, if it's public infrastructure, which it probably is, then we've got an obligation to make sure that they're clean and flowing properly. And if the the structures themselves need some some repair or maintenance, we'll we'll look into that. The other, the other part of this I would like to say was that uh, I live downstream of this, basically. Um, many of us have to pay flood insurance. And this is something we really have to be cognizant of, whether it's the developer or the city. And we're, I mean, we get a flash flood situation. It, uh, the creek ditch goes up to the top. And this happens occasionally. Uh, if we have a lot of winter rains, it happens occasionally. So this is something that, the project in the north part of the Downs has helped, but the water from this area comes from basically south and east of us. Yep. So it's not part of that part of it as much, the north part of the north part. Um, and the new pipes on the 10th Avenue have helped, but we're still popping up decently high. So I think this is something that maybe the city needs to work with talk with Al about this. Well, he, you know, part of the development process when that happens is he'll he'll be submitting a along with a, a full set of drawings a, a hydrology report and it will it will be uh, vetted thoroughly. Um, you know, obviously, um, you know, his work will be centered around this ten acres or, or whatever this is. Um, you know, it's not a, this is a floodway because it's a large drainage area. So there's a lot of contributing water beyond the old Char Charleston Square apartment. And um, the city needs to do its part in in maintaining the, the components of the drainage system that we're responsible for. I'd like to say that um, with some uh, help with the city. I think in general we're not against them rezoning this and the size of the project and anything else that comes up I would really like to work with them to help this work go through. Well you, you can uh, you know uh, my, my office or uh, my contact information is on the city's website. Feel free to reach out to me about anything related to this or any other thing that, that's in your general area. Okay. Hi. Mr. Land, 
thank you for your concerns. You know, Mike, this is in my district, and I spoke to Wendy last week about uh, letting me know, um, getting me a map of the existing drainage issues that I'm already concerned about for my uh, district-wide meeting, but I will be having a district-wide meeting soon. So can you um, just loop me in into the emails when you go to look at his concerning issues, um, the issues that he just spoke about? Certainly. And Mr. Land, uh, have you had a meeting with the neighborhood residents um, about this project? Have y'all all been in conversations about it? We have not had much conversation about this project. We knew something would come up at some point, okay. and I think that this is more of a, a situation where um, there was something there already before the tornado, mm -hmm. just like many other people had property and had buildings and things, houses, whatever. So we're not, in general, we're not going to be against somebody redeveloping something. Okay. And I don't think this is a case where it's going to be something that's open gun. Um, our main concerns were more along with you put the buildings back over there, you put uh, a parking lot, et cetera, you're going to have more water go into the drainage area. Okay. Well, just keep me in the loop on your concerns with the drainage or water runoff or any other environmental issues, and I'll be doing the same with you all. And thank you okay. so much. All right. Thank you. Mr. Chair, the next person we have signed up is Josh Hamilton, and I don't see a Josh Hamilton in the audience. So he left. <coughs> he left. We, all right. That's all we have signed up. Thank you, Carl. Cam, feel like y'all had a kind of ongoing conversation. Yeah, like, that's so. Uh, anything to really kind of, address. Kind of rambling around here. Uh, there, we're a part of the current regulations, uh, when I submit my plans to Mike for review, we will be reducing <coughs> the runoff compared to what it was previously. Uh, but we're 10 acres in a ginormous drainage area, so whether that's a measurable reduction. But we, th this, dev this development will have less runoff than Charleston Square Fountain Blue did, just by virtue of the regulations. Uh, but we'll we'll meet between nine city council and we'll talk about those technical details and we'll talk about what the people in the downs would like to see in that landscape buffer and make sure it fits with the planning's description of what has to go there. And we'll uh, we'll work we'll talk about those things between now and then. But yeah, this is the, for for this site. It's a low density development. It's less than what was there, and the current regulations require us to to do more to to reduce the runoff, so we'll take care of all that. Thank you. Any more questions for me? Nope. No, me. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, Commission, before us we have Z0123, Mr. Cadmus, uh petition to rezone is 9.141 acres from RMF3 to RMF1. Do you have a motion and a second? Motion to approve. Second. Mr. Rumsey. Yes. 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 Motion. Approved. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. We have three preliminary plats for you this evening, starting with SO123. This is the Parkview Center Subdivision 1. It's consisting of two commercial lots on approximately 6.3 acres, and it's located at 632 15th Street. This is in Council District 4. Here's the vicinity map. It's along 15th, right across the street from Central High School. And here's an aerial view of the property. It's currently one lot, and they would like to go to two. Here's the plot with contours and without. So the lot that's being created is in the southwest portion of this lot. And they are requesting a sidewalk variance. However, they will be required to construct sidewalks along lot two at the LDP process. So they're requesting the variance from sidewalks from the subdivision regulations. Engineering. We're good with that, and I actually already have the plans uh, under review for lot two, and it does incorporate the side. Thank you. Petitioner. Good evening, Commission. Jimmy Duncan again, uh, representing the property owners. Haley's covered everything. Um, this is pretty straightforward, other than the variance, which is simply to defer uh, the sidewalks uh, until the LDP process. Mike's got the drawing, so that's in process. Any questions for petitioner? Thank you. Anyone sign up or care to speak for or against this petition? Having heard none, commission, we have before us S0123 variance. 
the one variance request Cy walks engineering has no problems with. So a motion and a second. Motion. So moved. Mr. Orange. Yes. 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 Motion approved. All right, next case we have SO323. This is the resurvey of lots 43 through 47 of Edgewater Phase 1A. It's consisting of four residential lots on approximately 11.09 acres located at 11917 through 11933 High Point Circle. This is not in city limits. So this is pretty far north up along the lake. Uh, it's northwest of the intersection of Highway 69 North and Lake Larry Lake Road. Here's an aerial view of the property. It's currently five lots and they would like to reduce to four. Here's the plot with contours and without. So the lot line that's being removed is within the larger lot 44A. They're also shifting a couple of lot lines in between lots 46A and 47A on the right hand side. And then they're also shifting a lot line right near lot 43A in between that and 44A. And they are requesting a variance from Cap Sewer. Engineering. That, that waiver request is appropriate. Your petitioner. Mr. Chairman, members of Commission Bobby Herndon again. Uh, you guys approved a, this Edgewater plant a couple of years ago. The improvements are in place. All we're going to be doing is just making it less dense. Questions for petitioner? Anyone care to speak for or against this petition request? Having heard none, Commission, we have S0323, three survey of lots 43 to 47 Edgewater Phase 1, one variance request cap sewer, which is appropriate by engineering standards. We have a motion and a second. Motion. Second. second. Mr. Rumsey. Yes. 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 Motion approved. All right, Commission, last case of the evening is SO423. This is the Music Center subdivision. It's a reconfiguration of two lots on approximately 16.34 acres. It's located at 6325 Old Montgomery Highway in Council District 7. Here's the vicinity map. It's the existing Buddy Gray Music Center site. It's right behind, um, oh, I forgot the name of the business, but it's near the intersection of Old Montgomery and uh, McFarland. Here's an aerial view of the property. Upsurge is what I was thinking of. It's right behind that. Here's that plot with contours and without. So they are shifting that dotted lot line, or excuse me, they're removing that dotted lot line and bringing out the new lot line to run parallel with Old Montgomery Highway. And they are requesting a variance from Cap Sewer as well as a drainage study. Engineering. OC, we are okay with those. Thank you, Petitioner. Yeah, members of Commission Bobby Hearn again. All we're doing is there's two lots there. Still going to be two lots. We're just making them touch all the way around. Thank you very much. Anyone care to speak for or against? Having heard none, Commission before we have S0423 Music Center subdivision. Two variance request cap sewer drainage study. Engineering has no issues with. Do have a motion and a second. Motion. motion. Second. <laughs> Ms. Hornsby. Yes. 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 <laughs> that, was a, that wasn't a question. <laughs> A vote. Emphatic. Vote. Yes. 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 Thank you guys. yes. Motion approved. Mr. Get. Meeting adjourned. Go, go enjoy your breakfast, Sharon. You too. I'm going to walk around.